Blog Talk Radio. Good morning, welcome to the Galactic History Show. That's called being disconnected as, as the show starts. <laughs> and I'm getting a fantastic echo of myself delayed by a few seconds, which means I need to turn down this, which is done. Okay, it's a new week, folks. Thank you for finding the show, everyone that's out there. It's been uh, a, wi- a whirlwind and wild weekend for me. Went to a gathering of the One People at a uh, location in New South Wales, which was fantastic and great fun, but has resulted in me doing a uh, the usual uh, rush back home and pick up the threads. So welcome, everybody. Good morning to you. Good afternoon, good evening, hello to people on the podcast, hello to everyone in the chat room. Ah, I can see you all can hear me now, that's really good, really good. Okay, it's the Galactic History Show first for the week. Andrew himself is going to be around about 20 minutes plus late. He's actually hosting a number of people at the castle and is currently... um, being driven back there late, he's got to um, pick them up. They're going to shift to a slightly different location and call in from there. So he's probably about 20 minutes away. So we've got a, a little bit of filler time, which is actually useful because I've got a few announcements to make. And um, we've got a, a couple of callers here whose calls we can take. So there we go. Deep breath. Now, as far as announcements are concerned... Wanted to point everybody at www.sovereignmedia.net. It's the main website where or Andrew's webinar activity is being dealt with at the moment. And one of the specific reasons to do that is there's a number of webinars that are actually listed there that have taken place in the last few weeks. If you haven't listened to them, uh, it would be a pretty amazing experience to listen to them. Two specifically he has done with Julian Wells and they are both long and quite intense conversations with the Pleiadian Collective. The Pleiadian Collective is the the mm, ET group that Julian's been in contact with for some months now and if you've listened to the updates with Julian Wells that I've been doing over well over the past five to six months many, many times the conversations that have occurred have been in conjunction with that group. And they are extremely interesting, informative, and quite special. Specifically, the uh, on the webinars, you're, the, the webpage that's there is, is a temporary webpage that Andrew and his team are actually using to coordinate activities at this point in time whilst they build an entire website. If you want to find these conversations uh, and log on to the page, if you scroll down slightly, you'll find the very first one, which was the most recent one. If you scroll down the page about uh, another few screens, you'll find the second one. So the second, the, when I say the second one, that was actually, from a temporal point of view, that was the first one. It was, um, no, actually, it's, it is the second one, just looking at it now. That's correct, okay. First one was on August 8th, second one was on August 16th. I have a a number of questions about the second one for Andrew. The second one was actually a rather stunning uh, follow-up from the first one. As you'll find out, there were actually a couple of significant events that took place during the first show that were followed up with more events during the second show. This is things happening live, real-time, as the show progressed. And uh, someone will be making a probably be making a movie about that at some point in the future. I'll leave that one hanging so that you can find out uh, what what that's all about yourselves. Uh, very much recommend doing that. Note that these actually are paid downloads. They're eight dollars per download. Now that's been done specifically to cover the costs of the webinars. And the webinar rooms can fit many more people than Skype can. And because and, uh, you know there are extra facilities there that, that uh, Skype doesn't cover, and uh, they are there specifically to cover the costs of the webinars, 
and to cover the costs of uh, putting on special events. So, um, but worth it. They're about two and a half, two to two and a half hours long, and you won't hear anything else like it elsewhere, folks. Excellent. Okay. Further announcement. Last week I had a quite extraordinary conversation with uh, a lady caller named Thomas, who essentially um, started. We started a conversation, and I was just taking calls because Andrew had a, an actual technical problem and wasn't going to get in. Actually, um, no, it wasn't a technical problem, folks. He just couldn't get there. But instead we had a conversation with one of the callers which actually lasted the entire rest of the show. And I've had tremendous feedback about that conversation. And it's, it's sort of sparked two things. One was that there's another, another show that I've been wanting to do. And it's, a, if you like, a general purpose show where I can have conversations, do interviews, have group chats, take calls, just essentially talk about what's going on. And it was going to be called The Long Conversation and the call with Tomas really underlined how, how much I felt I needed to do that. And as a result, I will be starting that show next week and I'm hoping to have Tomas on for the first episode. But uh, I'll be trying to arrange that uh, during the next few days, but uh, one of one of my other intentions too is to do some updates with Julian Wells from time to time, possibly regularly, depending on his schedule. Depends on how all these things align. But essentially, that show will be something that is like the Swiss Army knife, um, from my perspective, the Swiss Army knife of discussions, where we can literally go anything, do anything. The um, it can be an, a, a follow up for shows for the Galactic Historian. I can have other people on um, because there's quite a wide variety of people I'd like to talk to and we can literally jump onto any subject. The other shows that I'm involved with all, all have specific purposes like the repurposing show over on my own network, One People's Oneness Radio. And if you haven't found that yet, that would be a uh, an interesting place, specifically if you're interested in the development of new communities and what the transition to the new, the new world, the new paradigm will look like. Okay, now, right at this point, I'm going to jump. Mm, I'm going to, someone's just saying in the uh, uh, in the chat room here they missed it. I think they're referring to the repurposing show. Yes, that was on yesterday, and it, I do apologise. I did put it on early for a uh, very specific timing reason. It wasn't yesterday, it was the day before yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, now I've forgotten what I was going to say next. That's okay. I'll talk about the repurposing show. If you haven't found that yet, <coughs> it's on the One People's Oneness Radio channel called The Repurposing Show. It's a show that came out of shows I was doing on Lisa Harrison's network, um, being One People's The One People Show and The Collective Imagination. And it was a show that um, I first discussed with those guys as a show to discuss how this transition might take place and what the result might be. And it's been very very interesting and continues to be. Essentially we're discussing some of the concepts that come out of the work of um, One People's Public Trusts, specifically methods of self self-administration. Some would call it self-governance and all of the topics that come from that subject which is huge. In fact we may end up doing two sessions per week, one specifically concentrating on the development of new communities the other concentrating on the transition. We just have to see how wide that uh, that net is cast when we start to really get into the content. Not that we haven't really got into the content, but we've been tracking a path looking at what the characteristics of a new self-administration system would look like, identifying base principles and 
moving into a situation where we understand the destination that we're going to so that we can actually logically work our way from the current position we're in to that destination. How would we get there? What it would look like? Okay, I've uh, talked enough now. What I think I'll do is jump on and ask the caller that's got their hand up what their question was to make sure we get it in today's show. And um, if anyone else has any questions or if they have any issues that they want to discuss at this point in time, feel free to jump in. The guest call in is, is on the web page. It's 646-716-8890. And let's just open up the phone lines, if you like, as they used to say in the old systems, to anyone that wants to discuss anything. It doesn't have to be related to the Galactic Historian show at this point in time. And we'll just see what we come to. So I'll jump onto the first call. Hi, Chris. And that's area code area code six one two. Hello. Could we have your name, please? I'm really well, Elizabeth. How are you? You are just working hard. You you're never slowing down. You're just going like a whirlwind there. I am going like a whirlwind. It's uh, uh remember be sure to take time for yourself, you know. Keep that balance. Uh, yes, Elizabeth, I have managed to do that over the years, and it's um, I mostly do that through um, through exercise, through training, rather than necessarily just chilling. Although I must admit, I do I am fond of um, of garden building. That's, That's the awesome. other outlet that yeah. I have. Yeah, excellent. Well, and I was just wondering if you actually caught that show last week with Tomas. Yes, I did. It was awesome. I loved the very end where she talked about where she used to work at a media station. And, you know, she just corroborated that, uh, you know, that really the people working in, inside, uh, they have a conscious and they kind of know what's going on. They do. I've, I've encountered others, others who've worked in the media and... I think it's it's reflective of what's happening ac across, really across the entire civilization, that the system itself, the people in the system itself too, um, well, the system itself could be run honestly, it could actually work if it wasn't built to be corrupted and if it wasn't so heavily corrupted. You know, if you look at it from a superficial point of view, uh, you know, it should work. And the people inside the system are just like you and me. They're just you know, living their lives f almost entirely. I, I mean, I have to say that the really, the really, um, well, shall we say, the, the people who are creating the manipulations and perpetuating the deception, they only amount to a few percent, if that. It's simply that right. they're the ones that, that actually dictate the policies of the organization. That's the conclusion that we've come to. Absolutely. And I was encouraged to know, to see that, you know, no, they're not bad people, the people that work there, but we all have consciousness, so it was encouraging for me to know that, you know, they have consciousness too, So at some point, at some point, there's going to be a breaking point where we're all waking up, and I'm sure they're waking up too, just like we are, and they're gonna, their consciousness will catch up with them and say, I can do this, they'll just walk off. Yeah, Even there was actually the an media. Yeah. So, now, Kip, just finish your thought, Elizabeth. Well, to me, the media is, has always been strong on my heart. Like, if once we see the media fa falling, so to speak, people waking up and they're walking off their jobs is a big, big tipping point for us. And I don't know, listening to Andrew, when, you know, seeing that we need to stand up, as we see people standing on the streets at the volume of the 60s and 70s, then we'll know the Dreamtime event is close. So to me, maybe that'll happen concurrently with the media, you know, and we're standing up on the streets, so that'll help those guys walk off their job more easily, and we can then have that Dreamtime event. Look, the so speculation about the the sequence of events that would take place when when the collective really starts to shift is absolutely fascinating. And especially the... the, the um, concept of, of it being a dream time event 
that Andrew's brought to the table has only really added to the quite significant range of events that could take place. And this is a conversation that I actually have, well, it feels like daily, but it's really several times a week, in some detail with, with different people around me, because everyone has their views on what is going to happen. How's it going to happen? What, what will start it? And how long will it really take for that to ripple through the collective and wake everybody up? And what will that look like? And my, I think the Dreamtime events become my favourite. And one of the reasons is that it's, uh, it's absolutely undeniable. They, they can't spin it in the press because if everyone has the same dream and the press try to, try to deny it, it, it's going to be completely obvious that they're being manipulated. If it happens, in, if some one thing happens in a certain part of the world and you know, it allows the opportunity for the press to actually, or the press to be used, the media to be used to spin that event, to frame it as a fear event or to simply deflect interest in it, dismiss it as they usually do, then, then that is a much easier event for the, you know, the old system to, to control, to try and deflect and put off. But if everyone's right. had the same event, and if it's come from within them, hasn't come from the outside, it's, not, uh, it's, it's come from completely within them, how can it be denied without looking like you know, complete sellouts? Because right. I can and just imagine, the, the, see the news anchors, the people saying the words on TV, they will have had the dream too. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we we have to be standing up. So they may not even be working by then. They may have already walked off the dub. No. Hi, yeah, but, highly likely. But my other idea, too, just recently, it's on my a blog, Diamonds with an S, Forever 31, dot blogspot. Check it out, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. My other idea was, okay, check this out, triggers. What if? Like, this is in the news now. What if the truth of how Princess Diana died comes out at the same time the truth of 9-11? Both of those stories, one covers, you know, the U.K. and part of the world, and the other, the 9-11 thing impacted the whole world. What if all that truth came out at once? Boy, I tell you, they'll wake up a lot of people, and a lot of people would get... Right, righteously angry and put up their hand and say, no more of this crap and stand up. You know what I mean? That's how I imagine Absolutely. It. Absolutely. There was a film called Network from back in the 80s, I think, where uh, a news anchor essentially has a more or less a nervous breakdown over, over manipulations that he's been involved with, realizes that, you know, he's being used, things aren't as they were, and he's basically... He, he hangs out the window of his apartment and screams, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> really? That's the sort of, yeah, that's the sort, of, um, the sort of response I can see that we'll in part get. The, the complete range, you know, obviously there'll be the complete range of responses from denial, initial denial, right through to that one. And, and that's, in, that's in fact where the um, sole contract revocations that Andrew's written will be fantastic because if, if people would prefer to say something deeply meaningful yeah. and very specific to the system, it's better than hanging out a window and saying, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, Even they, though they're they can read that. Yeah, they can read yeah. that with those declarations with their passion. And they can read them right now. Do you know, I've read them and I've, you know, other people have read them, do you know every time we read those, a part of the little house of cards falls? You have yes. a great big part in that when we read those. I mean, that's humbling if you, if you think about it. And the other thing that's humbling is, and we're blessed to have somebody like the Galactic Historian, you know, Andrew, even though we don't put him on a pedestal, but, man, we're blessed. Because if we didn't have the information he's given us, we wouldn't, like me and you, Chris, be able to sit back and talk and kind of you know, guess how it could happen in detail. So I'm it's, very, for me, yeah. Yeah, it's the detail that I'm grateful for. You know, you can think, think in terms of big pictures. Here's another couple of possible scenarios. The revaluation of the currencies, 
which uh -huh. is an attempt by the banking system to essentially rebirth the financial system by injecting a whole lot of theoretical, you know, theoretical value into it. And I say theoretical because the reason why I think it hasn't happened to this point is that they just can't get the funding. It's just not there for them. And they're trying all sorts of things to actually push the system into accepting accepting this proposal, which is essentially, they call it a re-phoenixing. It's where they, they manipulate events, move a whole lot of supposed value around the system, and then make a big announcement. Oh, look, guys, the system was going to collapse, but we relaunched it, and here's the new shiny, shiny, polished up version of slavery that um, we're going to inflict on you next. Just well, Chris, if you think about this, if it could happen even today, if it did happen today, we wouldn't stand up and we wouldn't unplug from the system and we wouldn't declare our sovereignty, in my point of view, because if it happened now, we would all be blessed and prosperous. And then we would just, I mean, we easily could walk away from it all and not reclaim our sovereignty. So that's cutting it short. If we have this um, financial system go now, even though I want it, you know, it would cut yeah. it short. You know? Yes, it w yes, it yes, it would. And the fact that they haven't done it yet indicates to me they'll never be able to do it. So I just so don't think they'll from, get that opportunity. So then we must go from a, a money paper fiat system to a moneyless society. But see, this goes into my questions I want to ask Andrew, because mm -hmm. once we have the Dreamtime event, there's going to be thousands of what did what did he call them? Unity conscious groups. Depending on what, yeah. depending on their yes. thoughts or their beliefs or whatever. So, yes, it, it's see that's another thing that Andrew's brought to the table: the 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 unity conscious groups, the soul family groups, springing up everywhere. Be, yeah, the way I understand it, stand it though, there could be groups that leave and the steal the money, and they don't understand that you are truly the value. And so that then they'll experience the money being revalued, the paper money that we've They will. I don't know. It, yeah. But I wanted to, well, that, that's what I want to ask Andrew is to kind of speak more specific on those groups and what they kind of would look like, different ones, you know? I think there'll be a, a wide variety of, of, of experiences inside those groups and of, you know, directions inside those groups. But the absolute torrent of communication around the world between people that will result from the, way, the awakening, I think will be the great leveler. There's going to be a tremendous amount of communication going on. And it'll begin by, you know, the big question will be, what the hell just happened? How do we get to this place? Which is where the, which is where the galactic historian's information will swing into view significantly for everybody as everybody tries to evaluate how we got into this position sort of at a, at a personal level and, and at a social level. And that conversation I is... Just, yeah. Those groups, you know, all those groups, thousands of groups, I still don't understand. I can't get it in my mind. One will have a different reality than the other. That just boggles my mind, you know? And then the other thing we don't know a lot about is unity consciousness. What does that really look like? What does that really feel like? Because... Unity consciousness will be in the realm of all of those groups at the same time, which I think you're trying to talk about, right? Yes, it will. And that's, you know, these are things that we'll simply have to take in stride. The ability to communicate en masse will actually make it a lot easier for us to actually chew on the problem of how do we self-administer a very large number of these, these community groups. And... There's going to be some webinars in, in the next month or so centered specifically around that discussion. It's, in okay. fact, part of, the, part of the discussion that we're having on the repurposing. And we're taking the repurposing in baby steps so that people who haven't run across the concepts before have got something to actually get traction with. Because it is very okay. difficult to get your head around what, what does unity consciousness actually look and feel like. Now, I've experienced it to some degree, and in fact... One of the reasons Andrew's late into this show is that he's actually working with a group of people who've come to stay with him to have a unity consciousness experience. 
Sure. It's so for, so foreign to us. I don't know that we can that it's possible to really describe it, other than other than you know starting at the beginning, which is that it's a no time experience that, that you know you literally lose the social agreement and the personal attachments to there being linear time. Now I've experienced this a little bit. And in fact, I did it over. It, I did experience this to some extent over the, the the weekend that just passed, where I was actually at a um, a newly forming community up in the state of New South Wales, which is the state next to mine. And it was a three and a half day event. There was about twenty five people in attendance, and many many discussions on the exact this exact subject we're talking about now. It was, I actually did about five or six shows from there. It was a really, really busy weekend for me, which made it you know, very difficult to actually get the full experience that everyone else was having there because I was being pulled back into the, if you like, into the time stream by having to do things to a time. Everyone else that was there was doing things uh, to a flow rather than to a linear time and I could observe that going on but I but uh, and I certainly experienced it in part but and it was it was very marked no one was paying any attention to time there were certain things that were agreed upon at the start that would happen but they didn't agree on a time yet they just happened when when they were kind of ready to happen well, that's a good description you observed I've been trying to do that every day. I am in no time. I'm on no time. I don't agree with time. I say that every day. And one of these days, I'll, I keep experiencing it more and more. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the, inter the interesting thing was that um, I could be pulled in and out of it. So that definitely is an aspect of it. The, so what, what that's saying to me is that, yes, you, you could move you know from that old mode to the new and probably from if you move from you know what does Andrew call them local reality bubbles you could move yeah. from one bubble to another quite fluidly and you'd find yourself being in a different flow of events but you wouldn't experience it as linear time and weird as that sounds it's really um, true, huh? it really is it really is possible and true and because I just experienced it in part uh, but wow. the actual the, the actual weekend itself was very successful. There was 25 people, and the, most of them had never met one another before. And the most striking thing about it, because this is this is um, the group of people that sort of came out of the work of um, the One People's Public Trust, who who literally go by a name. There's no organisation. There's no leadership. There's nothing other than other than common intent. Um, you know, the term is called the One People, which is one of the reasons that my other channel is called the One People, one, People Oneness Radio, which is a, ter it's a term that's actually proved itself capable of cutting across a lot of the programming that people have about, you know, how the world works. Because as soon as you, re as soon as you remind them that we are all one people, that really seems to resonate. It, it is... Um, yeah. Uh, really, it's a base level statement. What are we? Well, we're one people. End of story. There's, there's a full stop at the end of that sentence. You don't really need to go any further. So there's a great deal of of common intent there. And what came out of that were some incredibly useful group discussions about where we go from here, which we'll be speaking further about on the repurposing show next week. So if you if you're interested in this topic, it's it's a great time to step into it. And uh, an absolutely obvious meeting of intent, and I have to say it was the the degree of openness that came out was like nothing I've ever seen at a meeting of people who've never met. It was quite extraordinary. There was a wow. great deal of trust. Yeah, I experienced that. Do you remember when the Occupy movement started, like a, two years ago? Yes. I experienced that when I just was drawn to go downtown Minneapolis. I have never done anything like that. And, and uh, anyway, the, it was a lot of young people, like 20s, late 20s, 30s, and although 
conglomeration of people. I'll tell you, everybody talked to everybody in love, and we met up with, you know, to how to vote and everything. Same thing that you are describing, I, I experienced. It was awesome. And we never met before, you know what I mean? You know? That's it. I think that's, that's it. And it, it was, a, it was even... Go ahead. So the latency of Skype tends to make it difficult to have these quick exchanges. So I'll slow it down a bit. The um, ah, now I've lost my train of thought. Uh, it'll pick up in a second. Okay, I what? was uh, going to go in a slightly different direction. Well, that's right. No, the the Occupy movement and trusting one another. Yeah, the experience was interesting for me because everyone that was there had been following the shows, so they actually felt like they knew me and to a degree they they did but it really didn't take long for me to actually get to know all of them and I think that's one other thing that came strongly out of it and there was a very wide range of ages and and interests backgrounds you know no two no two people even slightly similar was all over the place I think that may what it may look like when we're gathered together to stand up and take our last stand to declare our free will sovereignty. You know, that may very well be our experience in peace and no violence, you know? Hmm. I prefer uh, to think of it as the first stand, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, we'll say that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I but I, you're, you're right. Yeah. When I went down there, there was a, cu a couple mornings I was going to make a, I made this love revolution sign, but there was a couple mornings uh, within a three-week period I woke up. Right when I woke up that morning, I heard a voice say, you know, I'm in strong, was strong in the Christian realm, Catholic realm. I heard a voice say, this is your sign. Uh, what was it? Death is swallowed up in victory was one of the signs I brought down to the Occupy movement and picketed with. Uh, death is swallowed up in victory, and then the other one was mystery. Well, he, the person actually said mystery Babylon has fallen, but they won't understand that. So, right, mystery Babylon is falling. I, <laughs> you know, as goofy as I am, I made, I was obedient. I brought those signs down, and I picketed with those signs. There's vibrations on those words. I've come to find out, I guess, you know. And that's actually yeah. what we're in. Huh. Yeah, deeply. The, if you if you feel something. Strongly, if something comes to you strongly like that, you know, it's one of the great lessons I've had the last year is to pay attention to it, to see where right. it goes, to work, to work out why it swang into view. And it's actually part of the no time experience. It's sort of trusting oh. the next thing that comes into view. And if you start following the sequence of events, that's what pulls you out of the, out of the, um, the social agreement of time, following the events rather than following the timing surrounding your whole life. Yeah, and one more little story. Uh, the younger people, man, they got gumption, I tell you. They had a, a noise picketing, and they were probably around 20 to 30, and we all gathered right when it got dark, and the police station was right downtown Minneapolis. Well, they did mm -hmm. a noise picket thing to picket you know, the hunger. The hu you know, you hardly even get any kind of food in jail. It's crap. Chris Howell speaking? Pardon? Yes, yeah, sir. Can you hold just a moment? Sure. Hold there. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I've just got a very unexpected phone call here, and uh, I'm sure, quite sure, the gentleman concerned doesn't doesn't know that I'm on the radio at the moment. Uh, a good a good friend of mine, and uh, I'm going to actually just if he's called me at this moment in time, there's uh, something happening. So this is live radio, folks. Just hold there a moment, Elizabeth. In sure. fact, what I'd like what I'd like you to do is continue what it was you were discussing. Oh well, I was just telling you about the noise picket I did with the young kids when it was dusk. They did it for the jail because they were picketing. Um, this is during the Occupy movement. The food that you know the, uh, they were doing a hunger strike because uh, the people in jail they don't get good food. They, it's really crappy. So we did a noise when they handed out whistles. We stood in front of the police station. We blew our whistles. They had a, a voice, you know, those things where your voice comes out loud. And I had this big plastic horn I got at the dollar store. I blew that. It was loud. And 
you know, they didn't do nothing. They knew we were going to pick it, but we made our show. It was, and then we marched downtown, the downtown streets of Minneapolis, all with these whistles and noise. And uh, the police even actually helped us along. So it was a it was a fun thing at the same time as a patriotic, you know, saying that we don't want that no more. It was just an awesome kind of experience. Well, I'd say you've actually experienced, the, you know, the microcosm of the macrocosm. I mean, that's the feeling that we had on the weekend. It was actually that it was fun. Yeah. And, but also incredibly serious and pivotal, Got yet fun. And, you know, that, that just raises the whole level of the, of the event when, you actually, when everyone's actually in that frame. And how, did right. the police, how were the police handling the attitude of the people that were marching? Were they confused by it? Were they aggressive about it? Well, the times I was down there, they actually uh, blocked the streets off for us. Uh, there was one time we all sat down. They sat down in a big circle in the middle of a four-way street downtown Minneapolis in the big, tall high rise. Everybody sat mm. down, and they just kind of just stood there and just to keep the peace. They were okay with it. And uh, well, they actually blocked the streets off. Well, back at the start of this conversation, we actually talked about people inside the system actually, you know, literally, if you like, symbolically or literally uh, turning their backs on it. And I can see that actually happening within the police forces as much as anywhere else because they're people too. You know, they, they're part of the, the old system. They have mortgages. They have families. They have troubles. And it's at some point when the switch is flicked, it's flicked for them as well. Absolutely. And, so and I, have... I want to bring that one more point regarding uh, unity consciousness. Like you said at the beginning, Chris, I want to encourage everybody to go to the... There's been three phone calls with Julian, Andrew, and the Palladians. Oh, my God, you guys, that's history in the making. You cannot miss those calls. I mean... You'd be one of the first ones to to uh, join in and, and with our brothers and sisters. But, uh, you know, the Palladians are already, according to Andrew and Julie and what we learned last week, are already in unity consciousness, and they have been for a long time. So I think we'll learn a lot about unity consciousness as we go on with the call of the Palladians and Julian and Andrew. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. And... The group of people who are actually with Andrew as we speak, um, I'm hopeful that we'll actually be able to pull him on shortly, they are actually with him for an experience in unity consciousness and they don't know they're going to be part of the show today because they're oh. in the event flow. Okay, so that was the plan anyway. That's, that's what's sort of going on in the background. And yes, the, sh the shows with, with uh, Andrew and Julian and the Pleiadian group uh, they are they are actually history in the making. The, I tell you. the sessions the, the sessions that Julian and I have had, Julian and I have had over the last six months, where he's either he's either been communicating with them just while he and I were speaking, or in the latter stages he was uh, organising groups of people on Skype to to speak to them, are also quite quite groundbreaking. We had some really amazing conversations, and if you want yeah, to hear so those. Yeah, yeah, there's there's good. about there's about about ten or twelve conversations that he and I have had between January or February and June this year up on the IUV i dash UV dot com website. That's i dash UV dot com under our cosmic friends um, or friends in high places, actually, it's called. The, yeah. the page is called. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of downloadable MP3s there. That will give you a feel for who Julian is. <clears throat> and, and it really is a, the story of Julian, that sequence of, of interviews. He developed the ability to actually speak to them over a period of about a year. And having finally done that, it opened a whole series of doors. And you can actually experience that by listening to them in sequence. Um, there's quite a bit of listening there. There's quite a, quite a few hours of listening there. But it does preface the calls that he and Andrew did in the last few weeks with the Pleiadians. Because, uh, I mean, Elizabeth, I said before that there were events happening during the show. And you know the ones I'm talking about. It was quite amazing. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. And one of the shows that um, Julian did that's on the IUV with you, I think you're on that one, Chris. It actually gives you big time way how you can get top to the Pleiadians yourself in a way. And it, there's like, some good clues there. They're not clues. They actually give you the little direction there. Yeah, good. the ple the Pleiadians actually set up some mechanisms whereby people who listen to that tape can actually use the facility they've provided. Okay, one of the interesting things about about time is that if you listen to if you listen to one of these shows or to the discussions with Julian or really to any discussions where there's human consciousness involved, it's as if you are actually in the original conversation. Your consciousness oh. is participating at that at that point in time space. That's called no time, right? That's no time, exactly. So if you participate in a meditation that happened a year ago, you're actually lending your energy back to that point in time. If you want to view it from a linear point of view, it doesn't actually matter. So if you listen to that tape where the Pleiadians are describing um, a communications methodology they called Allison, which is essentially simply yeah. presenting us with with the idea that there's a uh, an object which they've, if you like, um, nominated, will act as a literally like a, a a call portal. Then you're part of that experiment. You're actually participating with it, even though you listen to it months later. So if you if you find that particular one, it's one of the oneness place sessions. If you look for oneness like place there. It's the first yeah. and second one. I think it's the second one down on the list. Yeah. Yeah, you've yeah. obviously been look, looking at it recently, which is great. And yeah. uh, the, other the one whole thing I, I want to think of, Go ahead. You, no, you go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, the other thing I remember, too, to encourage everybody to listen, is I remember you did an update with Julian, and when Julian said that he talked to, I think it was the Palladians or somebody else, that there's going to be a, uh, he called it, 101 internet or something like that where the internet actually inter intertwines with you and they the internet knows you and knows your likes and dislikes remember that one yes yes yeah that was a a piece of um um well i guess it's a technology which apparently uh, is already under the under construction or has been constructed which will be a replacement for the internet and at some level it's bound up in consciousness and does work at a whole different level. One of the early things that Julian was doing was starting to give people some basic instructions on developing telepathic skills. And I'm not sure if those discussions are actually up on that site. It was a couple of sessions called Telepathy 101, which were very, very interesting and, and useful and... Uh, if they're not up on there, I might see if we can have them put up there because it gives it gives a a realistic overview of of what's actually going on with telepathy. Because what I what I didn't realize, for instance, is that if I have telepathic contact with you, Elizabeth, it's actually it's actually um, routed. If we want to use the network comparison, routed between our higher minds, and that our higher minds actually communicate with one another and then pass the message down. That's the actual methodology that's going on there. So part of telepathy is really in developing um, more awareness of speaking, literally, literally speaking to yourself. The higher mind kind of acts like, almost like an answering service in this capacity and you can actually do things to encourage that particular process. Really, yeah, really interesting but... stuff. What you're talking about, I just kind of came to a revelation just recently, but I worded it in a different way. We have a spirit man, a higher mind, or our, I call it our spirit man, and he, here's our physical body here on earth, and we have a spirit man. Our spirit man knows everything. It knows everything, like Andrew, I'll just say. So if you, it knows everything, but it's not going to answer. It's not going to give you any answers unless you ask the question, and Heather talked about this. So ask the question to yourself out loud or just into the atmosphere out loud, any kind of question, and see that you, shall, see that you get the answer. 
because your spirit man then can answer when it hears the question. Yeah, in fact, your higher mind is here to support you on this journey. You know, we're we're actually conscious on a journey of consciousness, and we've we've entered into a an arrangement on a planet where separation is is the key theme. But the higher mind is still there and still serving the rule being, as you just very rightly pointed out, you have to ask. Okay, and <laughs> answers come back in in all sorts of forms. Some of them just yeah. by hints and and some people actually you know even get feelings and to an extent voices a voice and when someone does a reading most of the time uh, they're actually talking either through or to your higher self and Julian's yeah. Julian's earlier earlier when Julian was developing the ability to do to do the Akashic readings you know he was finding he was starting to talk to to talk to people's higher minds and getting information from from that part of you uh, is is part of it as well it's it's part of the um, if you like the akashic read and you actually read the akashic through the person that's how you get information about them so the higher mind's very much bound up in that it's an absolutely fascinating process and wh one of the things i want to do on the long conversation show is actually do updates with julian on that show I just have to see if he's he's willing to commit to a specific time and day, and uh, that's one way of actually making sure that we have regular conversations. Because I'd like to continue it. Um, right. It's been a great, a great be trip. Yeah. yeah, and that it would tends. Be good for you know, just waking up. Those updates with Julian are really, really good for people just waking up to kind of ease into it all. <laughs> Yes, it is. And if you follow Julian's journey by listening to the audios, uh, it'll it'll ease you through that process, you know, because you can see some of the times he's just so excited about having discovered something new. You know, it's like Christmas presents. Uh -huh. And the whole, and you know, and, and in turn, that's that's caused him to change. Julian as a person has gone through enormous changes in the last six months. You know, his life has completely changed in many ways because of the experiences he's been having. And he's, he's in a sort of an example to all of us of the sorts of impact that these really incredible changes will have because although we've been talking about geopolitical events and, you know, what might happen here and what might happen there, We've got to remember it's an individual spiritual journey for us at the same time. And there's seven billion of us and it's going to be different for everybody. I need to tell you, Elizabeth, about a, a, a game that was played over the weekend at Lake Conjola, which if you listen to the last repurposing show, you'll hear a, a reasonably detailed description of. And it was this was part of the unexpected nature of the weekend. And I, I, there's a specific purpose why I'm bringing this up. This, this. If you've ever played, if you have used, it's, if you've ever used tarot cards, and seen the way that the cards actually um, bring out things that absolutely nail you in your situation, right. that's what that's what playing this game is like. It's, but it has a specific purpose. It, it's to help you to manifest a wish, to help you align with with a, uh, an intention. And you can do it individually, or you can use it as a group. And it's—I don't know. A, uh, I know how tarot cards work, and I know the, the kinds of concepts that the uh, that each card works around, etc. But never actually used them or or worked with them. But I can see now the relationship between tarot and this experience that we had on the weekend. The game was played between a, a shifting group of people. There were different configurations of people in this one game. And a game is really um, exploring a particular wish at a particular time. And leading you through a series of experiences, putting up, if you like, um, responses to that intention so that you can actually align with it fully and the objective at the end of the game is to come up with if you like um, several action statements so each person involved in the game that sets the intention ends up through their experiences forming actions that they are going to take to help that wish to, to ensure that the wish manifests. 
Wow. So I didn't I didn't join the game till right at the end, the very last evening, because I was running around doing uh, shows. So as I say, my experience was quite different to the others because I was kind of dropping in and out of what was going on with the group. So I came in on the very last session. They specifically, you know, twisted my arm and made sure I was there so that I had the experience. And I'm glad I did because it was really meaningful. Because the very first card that I pulled up, which was really supposed to speak to you personally in some way. Uh, now I've got to get the reading. The, the, the wording on the card was, um, "You walk the path of your inspirations." Okay, wow. which which spoke to what was happening to me over the weekend because I was doing stuff that that I feel called to do. Yet it was still contributing to the weekend in its own way. And uh, <clears throat> that you know, I sort of read the card and went, "Okay." <laughs> this, could, this could be a little spooky, this experience, and, and it was. There was a number of other things that came up that were, that were unmistakably directed at me. And, uh, you know, how does that work, that you pick up a card at random out of a deck and get right. messages like that? It was quite extraordinary. And my point, point was this, one of the cards I picked up seemed out of place. It really did seem out of place. And it said the the the, the journey to peace is is not a political one, it's a spiritual one. Okay, and, you know, we speculated when we were discussing what it meant right. at the time, and, and you know, we, everyone could see what it was talking about, but no one was particularly sure why. But I got, a, as you say, uh, the answer for that, for that yesterday when I was actually, when I was actually thinking about... Um, a conversation that I've got to have with some other people next week where we'll be talking about that and and talking about this shift and my and it's probably a, an interesting point to bring up right at this moment in time because we spent some time talking about the events that will lead into the shift and we're right. really talking about you know geopolitical events in the main and uh, you know the the possibility of a dream time event etc etc and what it what it really what really came to me at that moment was that at some point in the process where information is being revealed and everybody is waking up and and you know looking around at one another working out what to do what what will have begun as a geopolitical event most right. likely will become a spiritual event we'll have to suddenly realize we are consciousness on a journey. We are the value. You know, we've simply been playing a game. Right at that moment, Absolutely. right at that moment, it becomes a spiritual journey and not just a superficial journey of oh, there's these events going on in the world. Absolutely, yeah. I agree with you, Chris, because I've actually been on that journey already. Because I, you know, it started with the Iraqi dinar. <laughs> that was the beginning of my journey. I didn't know it was going to get me into all this. And, well, that, you know, I went from the money thing to the spiritual journey. That's exactly. Can you remember? It. Can you remember the moment when you realized it was a spiritual journey? Um. Okay. Well, you know, I come from the Christian realm. I say I walk in the spirit. However, you know, our language is goofed up. But I, um, I don't know. God was showing me economics and how this world was really screwed up through LaRouchePack.com, and he started, I would go on that website, and he would tell me, I learned the real history of the United States out of that, and then I learned about all the bad guys, and then and then I got the Iraqi dinar, and then I got on these, you know, the midnight think tank, and we talked about that, and when it was going to revalue and all that, and then one night, I just had like a, an emotional epiphany thing. I sat back and I asked the questions. I was talking to God or my higher self, whatever. And I said, okay, you showed me all the bad guys and all the bad stuff that's going on in this world. What about good guys? Is there any good guys around? And that's when I stumbled on, you know, Ben Fulford and all that. And then, so through those conversations that we had on the Midnight Think Tank, when I found out about the good guys, and the bad guys, and when all the pieces came together and I understood what, why I even got there racket dinar in the first place, that's when it became spiritual. I thought, oh, 
this is not about money at all. It's about our change, our DNA change, our spiritual change. And that was probably like a, a year after I got, I bought the Iraqi dinar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, I, you know, the, the path that I've meandered has been th through the same blocks of information in a different order with different emphasis but uh, you know at, at some point and I think it was when I read the uh, the piece called The Hidden Hand have you ever run across that? Uh-uh It's I essentially it, but... yeah it's a, it, for those who haven't heard of it it's a, it's a document published some time ago and it really is it really is it's an interesting document it's supposedly published by someone from within the Illuminati from within our partners in contrast and in and of itself it's it's the high level picture it's that we're here on a, a journey of consciousness on a spiritual journey on a learning journey and that even the dark is just playing a role yeah you know, that this is actually this 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 reality is actually a construct to enable us to advance rapidly by dealing with very very you know difficult situations lifetime after lifetime so that the the growth the depth of experience is huge in a relatively short period of time from a galactic point of view and yeah so i think it's a, a process yeah it it absolutely is a process and that's that really was one of the things that struck me and that was probably 18 months ago that um a contact of mine pointed me at that and said, "Hey, you know, you need to look at this because this is this is a better a better view, a more useful view of what's going on. If you just go down the us versus them geopolitical route, route it's really actually quite a negative experience. But well, as soon as you, as soon as the um, the the, the spiritual side swings into view, um, the negativity and positivity, the perspective on it." swings back to the neutral you can see oh it's just us having experiences and yeah. and playing a role it it brings you to the neutral if i didn't get into that economic stuff i wouldn't have be where i was today you know what i mean it wouldn't have swung me back but, that's right it, yeah. it's, it is it is a process but here folks here's the thing there's seven billion people out there who've yet to take even the first step on that road My consciously <laughs> They're they're on it unconsciously because they they are looking at the world around them and saying why is it so messy, why does nothing ever work, why do governments always appear to fail us, why does the financial system always appear to actually just use us, what's going on here? So there's plenty of questions being asked, but the level of detail and the context aren't enough to really trigger them to fully awaken as That's yet. That's why I say but there's going to be a. There's going to be big triggers coming, and I'm hoping soon, like in the next week or two or three. And and I hope, I just pray, and I hope, because I don't want to wait 20 years. I'm ready to stand up now, and I'm ready to, you know, gather the troops. Come on, you guys, let's do it in, in a fun, easy way. It'll be easy. All we have to say is we're done, and let's go stand out on the streets and say, hey, we're done, <laughs> you know. That's and, it. Uh, That's it. Yep, move. No, instead of them saying "move along here, nothing to see," we'll be saying to them "move along here, nothing to do." <laughs> there you, you go. Guys, well, you guys, right. you guys are done. You guys are done. It's our turn to do the doing now. And uh, look, I think instinctively people will know that the information that they get um, is True. the most important thing they ever heard. Yeah. Okay, and they have to. The the key thing people have to recognise is because the going to a moneyless society brings on a fear response from people when they first hear about it because they don't understand how it will work and how it's Me possible too. to tra transition. And it doesn't take that long to give them enough information to to chew upon to really understand that we could do this and we used to do this. <laughs> Okay, right. And the example, the, the the clearest example to point at is simply how your family operates. You know, you do something for someone in your family, you don't send them an invoice. Okay, you might do it with an expectation of uh, with an and and be happy with this, with an expectation of that you, you'll get no return from it today, but you'll get a return from it maybe tomorrow or the next day when they'll help you with something. 
will give you something right. or do something for you. You know, it's pure and, and interesting. The term that I sort of I think is useful to think of, it's actually an exercise in mutual goodwill. Well. And here's an, here's an interesting thing. They use the term goodwill when when costing out the value of a business. You know, what's the goodwill in the business, which is really what's you know, what's your customer base like, for instance? You know, what value is that? And a lot of the time it's it's there but the system kind of undervalues it. Right. The goodwill's usually not worth that much in a business. It's more the fixtures and the fittings, the the the, the actual stuff that's that you could take take off and, and, and sell and get an immediate return on and uh, in fact which I, I think is misleading because I think most businesses without goodwill wouldn't exist at all they just would not exist so it's really probably the most important thing in the equation and when when you said a moment ago um, we talked about the revaluation uh, I realized that there is going to what is going to take place will be a revaluation but not of the dinar it will be of the <laughs> the 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 way the people think of themselves that's what's going to be revalued absolutely it's called a reset or a reset that's a word they use too yeah it is mm. so the whole the whole scenario is going to be incredible to observe and you know one of the things i'm thankful for having gone through this process is that i'll be in a position to be more of an observer of what goes on yeah. Um, that one would necessarily be, although we'll be deep into it in terms of supporting family and friends because that's one of the reasons why we know about these things ahead of time so that we can actually uh, lift them up when they when they start to uh, react negatively to things out of just out of um, confusion in fact is going to be the one of the key things that, that we'll be resolving is the confusion of it all. Why is this happening? Why am I all of a sudden finding out that every government on the planet's a corporation? Okay, <laughs> and they're all co they're all co owned. Well and I don't know, the way I imagine that once this happens, the dream time and stuff we're not even gonna talk about it, economics or government or uh, or money, fiat paper money anymore because we're gonna have better stuff on the other side that are going to very much intrigue us and make us happy and joyous and blissful and I don't know I'm a big dreamer but yeah yeah well uh, I'm I'm betting that the the switch between the geopolitical discussions and financial discussions as you just described through to much more interesting stuff happening on the dream dream time I'm betting that will happen so fast that this whole process will literally look like the twinkling of the eye that keeps keeps coming up, and I hope it does. Well, you know, Chris, you're reading which, my mind. Me and my friend have been talking about that's going to happen in a twinkle of an eye. A twinkle of an eye, absolutely. Yep, I think so. And hey, look, we've actually we've managed to talk for a whole hour. I think we've been in no time. Oh my goodness! And uh, I I'll think. I'll just get off here. I just wanted to ask if you could ask Andrew to describe more of the, what do they call it, the, the thousands of conscious groups that will be with different realities? Yeah, the um, the local reality bubbles. Yeah. How, and your question more. was how, how, how different will they be and, and will that be a problem? Yeah, what would it look like? I know I understand some of us will go, go into those realities and help them. But, I mean, what would their reality look like? I mean, are they going to have the RV evaluation with the money? I mean, it just boggles my mind, you know what I mean? Those yeah. Those thousands yeah. of groups. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think for the most part, given that we've got a worldwide network of media, um, I think particularly in the West, I think the, I think the similarities will be fewer. They may be divided up on the basis of old system concepts, um, like, you know, religion. You may find groupings of people who've had a specific belief, uh, who are striving to maintain that, just as others might strive to maintain the monetary system. You know, you might even have a local reality bubble formed around ground groups who really like American football, and they're striving to maintain that as an art form. Who knows? Who knows, right? And, and uh, real quick, too, I don't want to let this go by. I want to give a shout-out to Nikki. 
Nikki, if you're listening, I love you. I love you. I love you. She's such a beautiful lady, and she's such an awesome healer, and I hope everybody knows that. And hopefully I'll get to meet her someday, too. Yeah, there's going to be some big parties all over the planet. Cool. People meeting up. That that would be fabulous. Elizabeth, thank you so much for spending time with us. What I'm going to do now is, um, um, again, thank you for participating. It's been Thanks, Chris. really great fun. Uh, I'm going to play some music, and I'm going to um, pull in Andrew, if I possibly can. I'm, exp I'm surprised he hasn't contacted so far. Um, so I'll, I, will, I may play a slightly longer bit of music than before, but that's a good sign, folks, because that means I'm probably making arrangements. Elizabeth, thank you for your time. I'll pop you back on hold, and we'll play some more music. See what we've got here. Yes, we've got my favorite piano piece here, so I'll play that for you. And in fact, um, I may even play it twice, depending on whether I get through successfully. But... Either way, we'll see you again in either of about... Hi, everybody. We're back again. Looks like Andrew and the group are still in Communicado. They were going to a specific location to do the session. And the difficulty they were having is just plain running late. So we'll see if they pop up again in the next hour. That would be great if they do. The um, next show, actually, will be with Nikki Thetsi. Nikki's Nikki came up. In, in discussion with Elizabeth just before the break. This is a galactic history show, by the way, in case you're coming in late. And we're having an ad hoc session because Andrew has had some plans um, uh, go off off into a slightly different time stream to the one we're on, which is an interesting thought. And uh, we've just been discussing a whole range of things with Elizabeth, who's a regular caller, which was great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And at this stage, um, I was just going to say that we'll be on with Nikki Fetzi on Thursday, continuing the discussion about the human user manual that you didn't get at birth, which has been a very wide-ranging discussion about all sorts of things, centering on human sexuality and sensuality at this point in time. And uh, at all times, a fascinating conversation and highlighting just how much of our own personal bodily technology has been literally hidden from us, removed from view, um, sometimes in quite negative ways, and the degree to which that has separated us. Now, just before we start the second half of the show, we'll, we're going to follow the same format. I've got a, a, a couple of callers here with their hands up, so we'll just find out what's on their mind. I wanted to talk about a little radio show that I'm doing it's, uh, with a couple of other Australians and, and an American host, and it's actually on, on AM radio in South Carolina, 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And uh, the gentleman that, that called me before and kind of semi-interrupted us is actually um, my friend Brad, Brad Smits, whose um, contact... Danny Brown at the at the uh, American end asked asked Brad to help him put this show back on the air. He had, Danny attempted to run this show several years ago. It didn't fly because people weren't ready to hear it. And Brad conscripted myself, and who didn't con he didn't have to conscript. All he had to do was ask um, ask myself and Scott Bartle to come on and literally just talk about. Specifically, what's wrong? What Danny was concerned about was explanations of what's wrong with America. But when we discussed the show with Danny, we said, really, the the situation in America just represents a template that's currently being used worldwide throughout the whole system to put very large populations under stress and 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 uh, in greater degrees of control. And we wanted to actually describe the situation for everybody, just using the U.S. as an example. Which, which he thought was fine, and we proceeded to do that. And we've been running for about six or seven weeks, um, still on the air, so we don't seem to be um, you know, denting anybody too much at this point in time. 
but we've arrived at a methodology of describing the system which I think is very interesting and you might find it useful when you discuss with people who aren't fully aware of what's going on when you discuss with them what what the system really is and it goes like this the the entire system on the planet is behind the scenes effectively one corporation call it one organization it's it's entirely co-owned either at board level or through shareholder level or some you know I'd have to say that the co-ownership is the key uh, on removing the shackles uh, releasing the shackles the blog that D runs if you're familiar with with D who works with Heather she's put up some really good articles about who runs the, the world written by folks who have been investigating this stuff for a long time showing the degree and methodology of co-ownership of corporations and how it actually looks when you start drawing it up as a diagram there are hundreds of thousands of corporations on this planet all the key corporations are actually co-owned okay and if you could if you could drill down further and that's where it starts to get more difficult if you could drill down further you'd probably find it comes back to the the groups of people we all know about the 13 families etc but when you throw into the mix the fact that governments corporations the law courts are corporations every every so-called government department you work for just think of it as a as a department store it's still part of the corporation everything in the landscape that you see everything that's visible to you is part of this entity there is nothing that isn't touched by it the influence extends down through it in various fashions always in secret always you know perhaps through a secret society here or something that looks like a, a, a social support group there sometimes it's just plain old bribery and corruption and blackmail to make up the rest of it either way it's it's become an all it's an all pervasive control mechanism and it actually explains why the world looks like such a mess when you understand the United Nations isn't made up of sovereign governments it's made up of members who are corporations like the country that I live in okay we're a member of the United Nations it's an association of corporations it's not sovereign governments sovereign governments the sovereign government aspect is an illusion it's part of the deception so the entire system is hooked up you know, essentially via the via the banking system that's sort of the hub of control and when you actually extend that picture out in your mind and merge it with the the system of nations you might call it you can see how the the entire system is controllable from several central points you've got the banking system you've got the United Nations and other organizations like the World Bank the IMF and specific bank parts of the banking system like the Bank of International Settlements and the Federal Reserve these are all control points in the system uh, for instance we discovered that the every major bank in Australia is not only heavily co-owned through other banks that actually are hooked back up to the the Federal Reserve but that they're all individually in hoc to the hilt through the UCC system to the Federal Reserve anyway the people who have shareholdings in banks are uh, living in fiction land their shares aren't worth anything to them unless they sell them right now if anything ever happens to those banks the Federal Reserve will be clearly the only one that gets any benefit from from whatever's left of a bank that might fall over so the entire system is a corporation and it works by division the the Roman cult of divide and conquer is entirely the concept behind this and, and here's how it works the planet itself is divided into nations when I say nation think corporation okay the corporation of that nation has departments think uh, essential services you know all the departments inside your government and works with other corporations who deal with smaller parts of that nation called state governments or regional governments and if you drill down further you're looking at some forms of local government who are again 
parts of the corporation, linked by co-ownership. At the surface level, they're linked by, by statute and social agreement. But drill down to where the cash flow is going and you'll find corporations and that the money is being fed back to places that really don't make sense. But when you realize that it's all part of the same thing and it's all funneling our energy, you know, think, think money back to a central source for use to further dominate and control, that's how the system actually works. So that it, it's at a political and financial level it's divided in and using the methodology I just described but now think about the rest of the divisions that, that are actually forced upon us divisions of religion uh, sexuality race sporting teams political parties you name it we have been divided up and set against one another from one end of this planet to the other the corporate system does it through competition uh, the political system does it through apparent differences in dogma, but when you understand the political parties are corporations, and again they're 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 controlled by other companies that are co-owned, you'll find that the key things that the political parties are doing in each country don't change when the political parties change power. Agenda 21, which is coming down through the United Nations, is being drilled down into all Western countries, in particular. And it's being drilled down through the political systems which are controlled. Um, uh, in this case, it's a trickle-down effect through the, through the UN system. And it's trickling down to community level right now. Okay, that's the game that's being played, which is why conversations about reforming communities in, that are independent of the system to enable people to build up literally build up the size of communities in the areas they live in to resubsume the local governments is definitely uh, a movement that's taking place right now and I'm sure it's making the other guys very very nervous but what we're describing on that little radio show that I'm talking about is really uh, a discussion that points out to people that they're living in a giant corporation and the corporation works by division and I'll throw in the final concept which is deception the entire system is built to work one way and look another it's a trick and if you you can offer evidence to people when you're describing this to them in the form of for instance articles like the ones on on Dee's website about what the, the the world actually looks like but also when you when you point this structure out to people it highlights why we have wars. They're, they're actually not wars between sovereign nations. The Iraqi war wasn't a war to save you know, the rest of the world against a madman with weapons of mass destruction. It was a hostile corporate takeover for the purposes of continuing to put, keep the planet in a state of fear and division, which is what terrorism is all about. Uh, it was also a matter of pulling another, pulling a country that wasn't in the Federal Reserve System into line and making them have a central bank. It was about stealing and controlling their resources. And it was all about knocking off some, uh, not, not all about, but in part about acquiring some ancient technological artifacts that were being held in Iraq. That was part of a mix of what was going on over, over there. But one of the things about the, the way the system has actually worked is that if you're looking at a major event, expect it to have multiple purposes. Okay, there's never just one purpose going on and there's always an underlying generation of cash flow because wars are very profitable. So anything that you look at, when you start to get into the, the scenario I'm describing, anything you, that you look at suddenly starts to come into focus. Ah, that's why it's happening. That's what's really going on here. Now, we're, we've got an election coming up in this country. The differences between the political parties here are so minor, they're not changing any of the major things that are going on, like supposedly you know, shifting the system so we can, we can prevent the fake global warming that's being presented. None of them are actually stepping up and saying, hey, it's a fake scenario. They're stepping up and just giving different methodologies for doing the same thing. You know, we already have a carbon tax in this country of sorts. 
and the people are unhappy about it so they're going to actually repaint it a different color and roll it out again it's just a game so the corporation operating by deception and, and division and we're using that as the mechanism for discussing this particular problem and I've spent time on this because it's really useful when you start to discuss with people because it cuts across everything that can be thrown up against it you know um, you know why are there always wars well wars are profitable look at who actually wins for don't don't look at the war look at the contracts awarded after it's done and look at how the re control of resources in the in the country where it took place have shifted look for political shifts in that country that advantage the corporation then you'll understand what's really going on okay the religious aspect of it is just an excuse the the weapons of mass destruction aspect of it just an excuse that was clearly outed in the um, Iraq conflict so at this stage I'll uh, I'll leave you with that particular line of thinking it seems to be working very well on this radio show and again I think it does does start to cut across a lot of programming because when you start to look at it it'll make sense and the evidence for the existence of the corporations is everywhere if you want to find you know your country's entry in the SEC website in the United States just go look for it just search their database for the, for the corporation you'll find they're all in there there's hundreds of them which makes things like the uh, there's an alliance supposedly have formed to create a new financial system with 120 countries in it this is the thing that Neil Keenan and his group were, were putting out there well 120 corporations whose co-owners have decided that um, it's good to play this little game of distraction is probably a better description of what's going on with that particular group so leave you with that thought leave you with that thought so let's have a have a chat to one of the callers that's here okay area code 804 could we have your name and your question hi Chris um, my name is Janice and I actually was hoping for a, a mini reading from Andrew I'm on his queue on his website which seems to be stuck in time uh, nobody's fault just very popular can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, yes. Nice to hear from you, Janice. Yeah, Andrew's um, taking steps to start up, start up uh, small group sessions on a webinar footing rather than doing individuals simply because he's been absolutely swamped with requests for reading. I get that. Reading. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. I did sign up for his webinar uh, yesterday or the day before, and it didn't... Uh, it, it was going to have a, a guest speaker and they were going to talk about soul families and soul groups which I thought might give me some of the answers to the questions I was looking for but the lady had a virus and was unable to make it so they're going to do that in the future so I am connected in with that but I, I, I feel stuck I've done all of his um, contract uh, revocations and I'm just trying I, I I feel like I'm going to explode and I was kind of hoping that he might give me a little insight on where to go next I, I'm also eager to, to connect I've connected with Nikki but um, uh, let's just say I thought I would try this today and uh, I'm having a lot of computer issues getting through to her with her forms for I have an electromagnetic field problem that constantly is making everything go down so uh, well, that might be of course interference and I'm trying to I'm trying to you know do clearings so that if that's the case um, I you know it, it won't happen but I'm not successful so I thought if I tried remotely to do it this way, I might be successful, but there's a reason, I guess. Uh, if you don't yeah, mind, but... I would like to hold on in case Andrew should appear and should be available. I am patient and wouldn't have a problem with that. I also want to say that I have been following the One People since December. I have followed everything. 
I read every single day for the last three years. It's basically been what gets me up in the morning is hoping to have some kind of a breakthrough. And I know I have a purpose, and this is why I want to talk to somebody that helps me to know where to go next. Um, I want to thank you, Chris, and everybody that's been involved with Op, Julian, um, uh, Nikki, of course, Andrew, everybody that's working so hard to bring us to a higher to a higher level of consciousness. I just am eager to find out what my role is in this. Um, mm. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, on behalf of the people who are working on this and putting the stuff out there, thank you for supporting it. I mean, it's uh, it's. Uh, how, how can you how can you actually quantify in any sort of mathematical terms the degree of change that individuals are going through and sum that up to the degree of change that the whole collective is going through? It is just beyond calculation, beyond imagination. It's huge. And look, I, I've talked to people quite regularly during the week who express exactly the same thing that you are. They are fit to burst energetically. Don't know what to do with themselves. Is that what you're getting? Yes, exactly. And yeah. and I'm excited about it. it. It's like the only positive thing that I seem to be taking in at the moment. It's a lonely journey. And I try not to focus on that part of it. Um, in some ways, it's a very detached journey but i'm driven it's like i know that there's a reason since i was a child that i have been looking at the bigger picture and mm. people don't seem to understand that so i don't try i dangle you know, the carrot but i don't try to force anybody's hand because i certainly know that's not my journey but um and they have their own journey but i i feel that way chris i feel like I'm on, I, you know, I'm on the fulcrum. I'm going to tip over. I just want to make sure I go in the right direction and that I'm of service in doing that. Um, it, it's, it will bring together, it seems like, a lifetime of, of um, pining. Questions. Yes. Life, a lifetime of questions. Yeah, there were a couple of folk there on the weekend who, who were you know, almost verbatim saying what you were saying the, the energetics are just getting completely overwhelming for them and uh, one lady in particular was really struggling with with grounding herself and we're able to work through various parts of that because I've had enough enough exposure to um, the guys on the walking and energy show which which you I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you follow that one as well but um, you know their grounding techniques and their views on energy um, you know some of those bits and pieces were able to help her almost on the spot for kind of calming her body down and and just you know smoothing it out so that um, she wasn't so dominated by energetic feelings all the time but even so, it's it's an ongoing thing because the energies are piling up higher and higher, minute by minute, almost, especially for the people who are sensitive to them. And uh, um, you know that includes people like Lisa Harrison herself. She's very sensitive to the energetics at the moment. She's going through the same kind of thing as well. It's it's like uh, you know, as a it's building up to a crescendo, all pointing at at um, you know events in and around September the 1st because we're going through another alignment similar to last month another astrological alignment and again one of those portals one of those dates where the potential for events increases dramatically and if the energetic build-up I'm, I'm, I'm having indicated from from people around me is is anything to go by yeah big things coming very big things. Well, I'm always optimistic. I'm, I'm learned. You know, the date thing is um, we're in no time. So I'm trying very much not to focus on any dates. And the energy I seem able to deal with. It's the manifestations that seem to be lacking. And so I, I know things are happening, but it's like, where do I hang my hat? Where do I go from here? I'm doing and being, 
and but I'm mostly being um, having recently retired and able to spend all my day on being with nature, you know, feeding the stray cats and the birds and being very much hoping that I make the earth a better place, but it feels so insignificant. I feel like I am supposed to be more focused, and it's, as I say, it's a lonely, it's a very lonely beingness because I can't really discuss this anymore with my friends. They've about had, you know, they they sit and don't say anything, and they're very nice, and they invite me out to lunch, but I can tell that they hope that I won't start talking about this, and I'm sure that there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of people that are all in the same boat where their families say, you know, you can come if you don't say anything about that stuff. So it it is lonely, and and I would like to focus instead on my isolation, which seems to be in my face every single morning when I get up, and more on how I can make a change. Yeah, look, I'm just seeing a couple of comments in in the chat. Yes. Um, everyone has that to one degree or another. There are, I have uh, three brothers. Um, there's a spectrum of response there from don't talk to me about that through to um, one of them who's switched on and knows exactly what's going on. And f- for my, the members of my family, because it's not just uh, that particular brother, it's others who, who find this information uncomfortable uh, we have an agreement that I won't discuss it while they're around, but they know where to find me. And that's uh, literally that's the agreement. And I've, I've said this to them. You know, at some point, this is all going to going to come forward. And at that point in time, I'll help you as much as I can. And really, I have a feeling that that the these situations will resolve themselves selves as these events start to kick off, you will find your friends will, will seek you out at great speed as soon as this starts stuff. The first time something appears on, on what they consider to be the purveyor of truth, which is t- you know, the TV set, exactly. they'll, be reaching for your, they'll be reaching for your phone number. You're, gonna, you're going to have far more attention than you probably would want at that point. <laughs> Exactly. I have a great deal of faith in that. And um, I, you know, I realize that there are so many other people that feel the same way I do. I just need for myself. I, it seems like I'm, I'm listening to blog talk radio constantly. I'm, I'm reading and I feel like I want to be more proactive or at least I mm-hmm. want to know um, what it is I have to either undo or release or whatever to move forward. I thank you, Chris. I won't hold the line up any longer, but um, I appreciate everything that all of you are doing. Just please, please, please continue to do it. I know you will. Uh, that, the absolute guarantee on that one. A couple of suggestions. Okay. Uh, what, area, what area of the States do you live in? I live in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Okay. What I'd go is, is to... Um, there's a lot of One People meetings organized through Meetup, Dot com. Yes. Mm-hmm. Meetups.com. See if there's anything within that's that's physically close enough that you can go to one of the meetings. Okay, I can okay, sure that will do make, that. that. That will make a huge difference because what will happen is that you'll start to have a a group of contacts that will instantly form as soon as you make contact with with people like yourself who are, who are reaching out because their their immediate family and friends are not on the same page, you will find an instant network begin to form as soon as you start to do that. So meetup.com is is a great place to start. Uh, for instance, here in Australia, there's, um, there's groups who use meetup.com pretty much in every state. Yes, and we have them. In fact, I know that there's um, one in the Richmond area. Well, I would reach out to those people because you will find that, that, that you will be able to um, you know, interact with people who are on the same page pretty much instantly. And there's a great sense of relief. At the One People meetings down here in Melbourne, which, which um, happen once a month, uh, 
there's always people turning up who've never been to one before and the reaction is always the same you know oh my god you know this is so great i can actually relax and 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 really talk about what i want to talk about and it's a huge relief for them so i rather than necessarily just just continuing to listening add that to the mix as well Sure. So that you actually get some real human contact going, real human interaction going every day on this stuff, and I think that will that will probably resolve itself into actions, things that things that you're doing, because you you'll probably get caught up in things that other people are already thinking of doing and organising, and and it'll just flow. You just need to put that little bit of energy out there, and I think you'll you'll be very surprised about how quickly that can fall into place. And the other is is to do the same thing with Skype. Do you use Skype? I do. Mm -hmm. You do? do you, are you involved in any of the chat rooms? Do you know, I don't call? know how. I, I know this sounds crazy, but um, I literally don't know how to connect with the Skype rooms. Okay. They're simply conversations. You know, if you have a conversation with somebody, it appears on your recent list. On my recent list. Okay. Then, don't I have uh, to invite or something first? Yes, oh, no. but uh, you actually have to have been involved in a conversation for it to appear on the recent list. But tell you what, tell you what I'll do. If you send me an email at top. Oneness. Oh, gee, I better be get this email address correct. <laughs> Hang on a sec there. Uh, yeah, top. Oneness. Radio at gmail. Com. It's top. Oneness. Radio at gmail. Com. Send me your uh, Skype contact, okay, and I'll I'll put you into a couple of rooms that you um, and these are just literally these are just Skype discussions. It's as if you had a giant phone call with fifty other people, and what was left on your recent list is a contact you can click on, and you can continue to use the chat function. Okay. You'll, as soon as you actually. Um, do this the first time you'll realize what's going on they're simply uh, using the chat function in Skype to to have a very large and continuous conversation so there are rooms like the cosmic room where, where people who are interested in talking about the galactics and say, say the work of Julian etc they all have conversations in there and there's others that are formed around the concept of, of for instance CVAX and there are DINAR ones and there are all sorts of Skype rooms out there and you'll find that people are um, involved in multiple conversations and um, if you ask they will shift you to those other conversations as well and it, again it will just flow so if you drop me an email I'll put you into I don't, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time in the rooms because um, uh, obviously I'm, I'm fairly busy mm -hmm. doing the radio work and um, you know surviving in the matrix etc and uh, there are a couple that I that I monitor more closely than others because you know the content is directly relevant to what I'm working on, which in the main what I'm refocusing on at this point is, is shows like the repurposing and the conversations about communities and, and uh, self governance etc. Right. Uh, so, so you have to be there. There are some amazing conversations going on out there, though spiritual conversations. You know, geopolitical, they're all out there. And, um, you know, if you ask on the Skype rooms about anyone who's in any rooms, you know, on this subject and this subject, you'll probably find yourself in three or four rooms immediately and uh, following some amazing conversations with people who are exactly like you. And what tends to happen is that you'll have a conversation with somebody and in, in the room and then go off and develop a direct conversation with that person. And you know, right, this is right. Skype. Skype is the most amazing network tool ever devised, and uh, it's once you once you step into that, uh, it will again. You'll find things will shift. Now it's not it's not the same direct communication that you'll get if you actually attend physical meetings with human beings, which are just fantastic. Yes. But it's a hell of a lot of fun. And lots of information, and uh, will add a you know many other dimensions to your to your day. A great resource, I know. I actually had to transfer to or to download Windows 8, and with mm -hmm. it came a higher level Skype, which mm -hmm. has I, I don't know it has hidden icons or something. It's like everything disappears on the fit page for me to actually 
progress from one screen to another. It, it's crazy, and I feel, you know, at the mercy of... Uh, Microsoft's... They? Yeah, look, I've, I've heard that too. I actually use the desktop out of Windows 8. I don't actually play around with the, um, the... The blocky interface at the start is really meant for touchscreen use. It's really like a telephone interface. It is. If you drop, it's impossible. If you drop, yeah, if you drop directly onto the desktop, um, there's a methodology for, for putting icons on the desktop. If you look up, look up um, move, move icons to desktop in the help files, it should tell you how to do that. Uh, because at yeah. the moment I don't... Yeah, if what because I, I literally have it set up to run like Windows Seven, where I'm just using a desktop with icons on it, um, but Absolutely. most of the icons. I, what I want to do, I didn't know you could do both, but the other is yep. like it virtually took my computer from me. If, if I feel trapped by my computer, and I say, "Is this something telling me I'm not supposed to go further on this?" But thank you so much, Chris. I will do that. I will do the move to the desktop. I will do it through Skype. I love Skype. It's a huge resource. And until I did the Windows 8 thing, which kind of jammed me up some. But thank you. I really, really appreciate this. This is wonderful. And I want to thank all the listeners that are patient with me and trying to sort this out. Thank you so much. You are most welcome. And I thank you for your call. And we'll probably be talking again sometime. So, yeah, just drop me a line and we'll, we will get you going there. We'll do that Janice, for thank, sure. Thanks for the call. You're I'll welcome. Pop, pop you back on hold. Thank you. Okay. Cut her off just at the end there. I'll just see if I'm getting any messages through from Andrew. Not at this stage. Disappeared off the face of the planet. No doubt we will catch up with Andrew later in the week. He's... He's added another layer of activity by having physical guests at the castle to actually interact with, and uh, I think he's he's learning the um, degree to which that adds complications to all the other things that he's currently doing as well. More lessons to be learned. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes left in the show. Had some really interesting little conversations going on here. We've got... Um, Whoa, we have one more caller who just put their hand down. Okay. Got lots of callers here, but no one has their hand up at this stage. The um, the phone number, if you wanted to dial in and discuss anything, is 646-716-8890. And if you have any questions that I can help with, because I can't do readings for you at this point, then pop your hand up, um, just press 1 on the keypad in Skype, and that'll pop your hand up. Uh, otherwise, getting some interesting conversations here about Windows 8 going on. Yeah. Open line, in 5D open lines, yeah. This is a two-hour show, but it is scheduled for longer so that we don't get cut off right at the end. So there is a chance Andrew will come in and do some stuff at some point before we actually close out. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully he'll, I'll have some communication with him shortly. Now, we've been going through the user manual for the human body the last few weeks. With some, it's had some pretty incredible information, information coming out. Um... I've got a whole bunch of questions to be asking Andrew about that. But at this stage, I think I will um, add something to my our discussions from earlier with um, where we were talking about the local communities, in particular um, the aspect of them being their own little realities and how that might actually play out. And this is a discussion that I have almost an infinite number of variations of when I start to talk to people about it because everyone has their own particular view on how that might look, how that might roll out, but there's one aspect of it that, that seems to be missing out of the general conversation which we'll be trying to inject into it over the next few weeks because on the repurposing show we've actually kind of reached that point and, and that's the 
if you like, the structural and lawful basis on which these communities are formed. If we have this worldwide swing against, well not against, simply away from the old system to something new, and because the old system so irretrievably corrupted, we literally are faced with creating something new, not from scratch. We've got plenty to build upon, but something new that's never been seen on this planet, well, perhaps that, that might not be true, that hasn't existed on this planet for a very, very long time because it's become quite obvious that there's been plenty of previous civilizations operating at a very sophisticated level, probably on the lines that we'd like to operate on. Now, the base model that most of us have begun this pattern of thought on is the CVAC systems model presented by Heather Tucci Giraffe in the One People's Public Trust filings last year, which in and of itself was somewhat of a hybrid, but you know, built built for a purpose, and the purpose the purpose really in the end was to educate us and draw us further down that path, but at the same time it provided a tremendous resource for discussion because it presented the new paradigm in sufficient detail that we could really start to get our heads around how it might work. Now I call that hybrid because there was a lot of old system concepts in the description. Uh, there was a, you know, a completely specified contractual process for activating a CVAC and having people join that join that organization to actually become participants in it and and serve it and to serve the people and terms like you know oaths and bonds um, you know, cyclical contracts creating sub entities to do specific things like you know it's somewhat described almost like departments if you like then you know looking at these these are fairly old well, they're derivations of existing system uh, processes and concepts. The interesting thing about what happened after the CVAC description was the description of operating on a universal exchange and literally entirely focusing around just that one simple element, something that allowed us to have energetic exchanges that were recorded, which could then um, you know, lead to lead to a society that was completely moneyless, without any apparent structure, yet still function at a very high level. So we were presented with with two models, both of which were working under universal law. The UCC was the, the um, CVAC description was uh, is still engaged in using UCC initially. It was before that was technically reconciled, uh, and common law. Now, the model for working under, under the universal exchange um, with accommodation contracts between individuals is really the most likely destination that we would reach very quickly, is, is what I suspect. The people who went through the process of following the one people's work, following the the work of the um, of the trust, very quickly learned that anything that even resembles hierarchy leads us back to the same path. The CVAC system did have a touch of hierarchy in it. It was fascinating to watch what happened, and I think it's one of the reasons why Heather pushed on her concepts. It was it 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 actually had the role of president as part of the CVAC, and that might sound like it was not a problem because you know our concept based on the old system is we we have to have some sort of person leading the fray, which is you know the leader. In this case, it was called the, the president. It was the only titular role. It was the only thing that actually stood out as as having an what we would perceive from our perspective here in, in the hierarchy that we're trained to actually live in, it appeared to be elevated. And she, at one point, asked people to start thinking about and send in you know, bonds to become public servants. Well, here's what happened. Everyone wanted to be president. Okay, now, 
in and of itself that's fine but you're you're actually got an indication there that that something's not right had we had that pushed on further it probably would have it probably probably would have corrected itself but because of that initial response i think that actually moved the trustees to uh, it was one of the things that moved them to actually close down the trust because they could see it was still enticing us back towards hierarchy and one of the objectives in this whole process is to simply remove ourselves from hierarchy and act as individuals, as our own leaders, in full responsibility and liability. And that's really what came next with the universal exchange, the concept of eternal essence, that we have no limits, that we, that we are the leaders we've been waiting for. And, and that was adopted very readily by most most of the people that were following the leading edge of that particular thought and in fact that's that's in fact my personal opinion that's the best way to think of the new is as a completely flat situation no hierarchy people directly involved in decision making at every level required and the only we actually don't need under those circumstances provided we have agreements in place to act lawfully under universal law and i think there's going to be elements of common law in there provided we have those those agreements of the principles in place what we'll end up with is no government will simply end up with a fluid uh, a, a fluid system where groups of people are put together willingly, knowingly, to solve problems and create resources for the community as and when they're needed. There will probably be a small central core of, of constants who are there to act as uh, overall coordinators and spokespeople, but I don't think you'll see a government, particularly if the degree if the if local communities strong local communities form there won't be any sort of overseeing entity at all what will happen between all those community groups locally and globally are agreements to cooperate in creating resources that everybody requires to serve everybody and I think it will happen so organically once we're in it we'll wonder why it took so long to get here okay we've got about a minute left um, there is Oh, I'm just trying to see if there is three six zero. I think there's one more caller just popped up, and actually, we'll we'll take the call because we do have a few minutes left. I'm going to probably uh, stop this after the two hours because I'm not sure that Andrew's going to make it back. Hello, area code three six zero. Niall. It's me. How you doing? Ah, Andrew. You knew that. Yes. I, I've been in the queue here for a second. You just didn't see my name. Yeah. Look, um, there's no name coming up, Andrew. You've just got just got a number coming up. It's just pure serendipity that I hit the button. How are you? Uh, well, we were just typing in the blog talk yeah, blog talk chat room that uh, we were in the queue waiting for you to see us. Okay. There you go. Well, you're here. And yeah, I presume yeah. you've, you've arrived wherever you're going to arrive? Yeah, we are in Lake Crescent at the Lake Crescent Lodge, and I'm joined by Su uh, <laughs> Pavin and Susan Stairs. Sandy. Sandy Stairs. So they're here for the No Time Experience, and uh, they're going to join us live for the show and, ha and share part of the experience. Excellent. Well, Andrew, what we're, we're right on the hour. What we might do is give pe people a short music break, and uh, I've just got one thing I have to do to make sure that I can continue yeah. on. Are you okay to wait for a few minutes? Yeah, I'm okay to wait. Excellent. Okay, well, what I'll do is um, leave Andrew on the line. I'll just play a song for a few minutes so people can grab another drink. And it uh, looks like we're going into overtime today. <laughs> okay, and we're back. Everybody's had a chance to take a nice few deep in-breaths. Andrew, you're still with us. We are still with you, and we are looking forward for this extra extra hour that's going on here. Thanks for sticking around, Chris. 
Hey, we had fun. We had fun. We had a couple of great conversations with some regulars, and I was able to do a bit of my own putting forth of thought. All good. Well, we have a special treat. Uh, the lady that has put together the Galactic Historian Facebook page is with us, and we have a, a very much a Vancouver connection coming down to this uh, Beat the Galactic Historian event. So we've had six of the nine that have come are from Vancouver. Wow, <laughs> something's hey, happening in Vancouver. Yeah, Hello, everybody. They're, they're, wait, they're fast. Hi. We're also joined by Pavin. She also came down. So why don't you say something about the Galactic Historian Group? Well, <laughs> I just I started the group because I wanted a place where uh, everyone could gather and talk about everything that we're being exposed to and be able to access the shows that we miss and things like that. So um, it's, it's been great. It's only been a month, and it's taken a life of its own, and it's growing, and I'm really happy about it. And uh, I'm going to try and get all the schedules in line so that there's more changes happening with Andrew's schedule and uh, try and get some kind of a system there so we can all figure out where he is and, and what's happening. Yes, he, he's, he's actually um, can be quite um, hmm, interesting to follow along. There's so many events happening in and around what he's doing that mm -hmm. the, lands the landscape and the timing changes very rapidly day by day. Now, is this group that you've got going, is this centered on Facebook? Yes, it is. It's called the Galactic uh, History Discussion Group. Okay, so it'll take it right most of the people in the chat are probably on it anyways, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what it is. Okay, well, there might be a few people who are not, but I was speaking to um, uh, Janice earlier, who's who's kind of looking for connections to make. So, Janice, if you're listening, if you if you if you're not on Facebook, uh, it would be great to register on Facebook, and then you'll be able to drop straight into the Galactic History discussion group page. Now that also would include the usual Facebook chat function so you can discuss with others? Um, it's I like a know. group. It's yeah. like a group. So you it's can like a group. Yeah, it's just okay. a group. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can make connections through the friending system in Facebook and start up chats that way I presume? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well Janice that would be the, the way to actually go about it. Janice was a caller who was saying she was feeling quite quite isolated in a lot of ways and so we were talking about how you use Skype and how you use meetup.com and uh, this is just an, uh, a third option for anyone that's that's looking to find like-minded people uh, through that Facebook page so thank you for bringing that forward you're welcome yeah. so Chris it's been a, it's been an interesting uh, inaugural show on 5d and in 5d network uh, how things have go for the first two hours? Well, it was similar to last week when you were were unable to make. In fact, this this the same show last week. I think it was the the first show, and uh, a very wide ranging discussion with several callers, covering the whole gamut of what's going on. Because you know, we, you you ask you ask someone what's on their mind. Well, pretty much everything's on their mind. There's really nowhere you can't go with these conversations. But very excited about the possibility of things starting to shift soon. Um, really feeling that everything is more imminent than it ever has been. So the energetics are building and people are feeling it. And that's really what's coming out in the conversations. And we, we literally touched on a, fairly, a fairly detailed discussion on how, how, how the events might unfold, where it will start, what the emphasis will be. Destination is pretty much the same, though. The um, you know the unity consciousness, uh, smaller communities, intensely focused, particularly around soul groups, and and the absence of overall control. You know the pr the presence only of the minimum number of agreements required to allow the world to create what it needs for people to live the way they want. So it was, a, it was a good discussion. Very cool. So uh, we're broadcasting live from Lake Crescent, right next to the Lake Crescent Lodge. It's about 30 miles away from the castle. 
and it's one of the deepest water lakes, uh, freshwater inland lakes in America. For many years, they actually didn't even know how deep it was until they got modern technology out here. And uh, it's like one of those um, massive ridge and valley systems that there was a, a big cave-in and the water was trapped, uh, locked off from the ocean when the ocean was receding. So a very special and incredible place over here. And um, the people that have been coming down have been sharing the no-time experience. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone that showed up, uh, Eric and Morgane and Sherry. You know, you guys were the first ones out here, and you know, the Vancouver connection is still going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm also joined yeah. by Pavan. Pavan, say hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Pavan. I'm from London. Um, I was introduced to the world of Andrew Baptist only last week from Sandra Stairs, who you just heard from. Um, was absolutely inspirational. I had no idea why I was coming here this week, but I felt very drawn to. Um, and what I'm really feeling is, I was sharing with the group here, is that I would really love to get this work exposed more in London. I know we're a global network. I know we have global mediums through which to connect, but I really think there's something to be said for the real-time value of being sat next door to someone at a cafe or at a restaurant, and you spark something because you never know who you're going to talk to, and you never know what that person might create for us going forward. So I believe that, um, I think this is amazing, and I think that there's a real message here to share. So I've come here to work out what my part in that might be. Uh, I've come to educate myself. Um, I'm an ex-economist, ex-banker from the city of London, um, who's had an upgrade, and so who's choosing to live on the other side now. Um, and yeah, so we're here by the lake, and. Um, we're really excited. We're, um, I think this is where we're going to help birth the uh, London connection. There you go. So thank you. Yeah, Pavan, uh, one of the conversations I had earlier was, was about, that, with that particular person, was about at, at what point the geopolitical journey became the spiritual journey. And I'm fascinated to hear your story. It sounds amazing, the fact that in one week you have had this you know, right turn and moved in a completely new direction. Was there any particular thing that set you down the road when the point at which I'm interested in the point where you stopped being a banker and involved in that part of the system? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, it started off for me, it started off when I was sitting at my desk and I would look at the inbox and I would look at my polystyrene, you know, lunch phone box. So it started off from there thinking there has to be more to life than this. Um, and then it was around 08, actually, when everything kicked off that um, I guess the seeds of conscience were planted. And I just thought, you know, to keep coming back into this industry and representing this industry, um, it's just on a, on a, yeah, on a, on a soul level, something shifted or just something shifted. And... It was just a knowing. It was just like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I can't get on the metro and I can't come and walk through these big glass doors and be a part of a system of people and ideas that I, you know, I really am starting to feel uncomfortable with. Did you just leave your job in the end? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like it took me two days to decide. Um, and I walked into my boss's office and I just said, you know, I need to go because... Uh, I guess I wasn't as forthright as telling him the real reasons, uh, but I think he figured it out anyway from conversations we've had at lunch break. Um, so actually I now feel that maybe part of my little bit is the cog that I can fit into the big machinery is um, to go back actually into the city because I've made friends, I have a, a network, um, and I would love to use, I guess it's not by chance that I you know, came through that industry, I would love to use this medium to get back to those people in particular. Wow. Yeah, look, I'm sure there's plenty more people inside there who are really questioning what they're doing. Oh, and yeah. Again, part, part of the conversation we had earlier in the show was that in and of itself, if the system wasn't set up to be so corruptible and didn't have the policies, the management policies it does, it would actually work. You know, it's still a hierarchy, yeah. but it would work. But either way, throughout the system, there are people who have a conscience. And if they knew the truth about everything that was going on, they wouldn't be part of it. And that when this information starts to come out, and it has already started, that their consciousness will be triggered. And maybe that's your role to go back in and, and help people complete that. 
Well, I've been having, um, I've had great visions, or I've been inspired um, to go back into London because of who I am in a sense of who the character of my nature is. I always managed to sort of get in with the big wigs, uh, even though I wasn't maybe that much of a big wig myself. And people used to say, oh, you know, how do you do it? How do you get to talk to so-and-so? You know, he's on the, he's on the board. And I'm like, well, he's just human. We just connect on the, I just connect on a human level. But um, I won't name names, but I know I can see a vision of getting myself back into London. I know I can access the office of a man who's running a big global investment bank, and he's, he's, he's one of the top 13 globally. Um, and I can sit him down, and I know I need to talk to him, and I know there's something I need to share with him. Um, and what I, I... I hang out with a lot of spiritual people per se, but I don't... I, I, what I, what's important to me is the medium through which this work is taken forward. And I know that, you know, you, you can't walk in in your robes and your floaty hair. You kind of need to go in, you know, looking. Um, you need to do it through an intelligent, neutral medium. And I think that's what I'm about. And I know that that's why I would get an audience with this man. And I know through one conversation, having, you know, having that conversation with him, I know the knock-on effect it can have. Brilliant. And uh, look, there's around me. There are a lot of people who who have incredible incredible insights and, and information about how the banking system actually works from our perspective as as the the customers. And yeah. um, before you before you do that, um, I'd like to actually speak directly with you about some of the things, some of the subjects that that we think need to be put in front of those really? people. I'd love. And yeah, that would be good. Thank you. There, because there's certainly um, some some really very specific lines of thought that need to be put in front of them. You know, yeah. and one of the questions is, you know, the world is going to change. You know, do you want to be a part of it? Be a part of the problem. Be a part of the solution. You know? Exactly. How is your How is your family today? How are your grandchildren? Absolutely. In their perspective, so you know, there, and there's others. There's more technical lines of thought, but there's also that you know, it becomes a spiritual journey at that point. You know, make a make a decision of consciousness, a decision of conscience, rather than a commercial decision. Yes, and I think you're you're making a brilliant point. It's not about. I think on some level they all know that what's going on is not right, but to bring it into the the zone of, of the heart center for them, which is their family and their future generations. And what, as you said, the, what are the repercussions for their children? Because you kind of need to, the way it worked for me in investment banking was I used to take people out of the suit. I didn't let the suit intimidate me or the identity or the facade I, intimidate me. I would know that there was a person behind the suit, a person with a family and a person who's wearing a huge mask right now. And the other thing that I know that's on my side is that I know that he wants to take his mask down. He's tired, and on some level his conscience knows that he can't keep you know, carrying this on either. So yeah. so yeah, that's exactly, you just hit in on the human level with someone, and that's always worked for me. That's all it was, yeah, because a, a lot of these, I'm sure there's a lot of people like him in the banking industry, and yeah. many, many of them are, are held, held where they are out of, out of uh, fear, Quite literally, fear of yes. the repercussions, and not not just from the organisations they work for, but from the people themselves. And if I mean, you, it, it's it's quite probable you've been following the the sort of concepts and thoughts of the group called the One People at this stage. And what's engendered in part of that is 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 no judgment and forgiveness. You know, you, if you turn if you turn from where you are to serve, you know that that is a a, a gift. To us, because that will actually that'll actually move the collective in the direction it needs to go so strongly, when enough of those these guys actually step forward, because small actions by them will will have a dramatic trickle down effect throughout the system. And what what I've really enjoyed seeing, Chris, is over the ten years, I've seen the way people have shifted naturally from, and I'm. They've shifted naturally from sort of being part of the system and, and buying into it and thinking it's okay. But then through chats you have by the, you know, the drinks machine or in the cafeteria, you can see that something's kicking in. Something's eroding whatever they've been believing in as well. Um, and I know that, so I know what, what I want to create the change in the industry with. I know it's already happening there. It's been happening for a few years. 
and and now I think is the perfect time to come in and you know exactly position it as I'd like. Fantastic. Well, well, look, look let's not not hold up the rest of the show sure, with this you. subject. Though, I, though, I'd like to absolutely keep doing it as as soon as possible. Um, I think it's incredible that you've actually sort of discovered Andrew's material, and in in in, in a week here you are, you know, in Western United yeah, States. Much. At, at a unity consciousness session, congratulations! I'm Thank sure you there's very plenty much. of people, plenty of people that are listening to this call who would love to be there with you. Brilliant! Thank you, Chris. Bye bye. You're you're most welcome. So, what was it that that hooked you into listening for a week? What was it that hooked me into you? Yeah. Uh, I I think it'd have to be your uh, <laughs> probably Ambassador Sandra Stairs from Canada. <laughs> 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 Um, what is it about your work that hooked me in? I think with so many of us right here connected, it, it was just, it was a truth. It was just something woke up in me. And what I was hearing, I mean, I studied at the London School of Economics. You know, I studied a semester at Harvard. I've worked in a big investment bank. I, I'm around so many intelligent people. I hear me brilliant theories. But nothing ever resonated. And nothing resonated like the first sentence that Sandra shared about your work which, um, well, it was a little CV of you, actually, <laughs> and what your ability is. Um, and I just got what a change you can make through who you are, through the gift of who you are. Um, it's just information, and it, I, I couldn't pick one sentence. It is the basic message that you're giving that works. Thank you. Yeah. And what about for you? What, what's jumped out for you? I mean, you started a galactic historian group. I mean, there's got to be something that you knew when you heard it that said, this this is the information that I've been looking for. Yes, it just resonated for me. But I've been following the one people since you know it was the the OPPT, and I've been following Chris and Lisa and everybody else, and along that journey, and um, which led me to to you, and um, it just. I don't know, like symbols, but <laughs> you know, in my ears, it was like I, I just knew it. Just my my body almost shook when I heard this stuff, and I I, I had to ha I had to have more. So I just went back into the archives and started uh, listening to everything that I hadn't heard and tried to catch up on everything. And um, I've been running ever since. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Amazing. And Andrew, who are we spe who, who just remind me who 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 were we speaking to just then? Sandy. Just so I Sandy. Yeah, Sandy Stair. She runs she runs the Galactic Historian Discussion Group on Facebook. Excellent, Sandy. Um, you know, thank you for being so proactive and making this happen, and and thank you for really jumping in and bringing this unity, uh, you know, enough people down to the unity consciousness session that Andrew is doing, because I think it's really important. And Andrew, you won't you won't hear this until you listen to the archives. But part of the conversation at the the, the start of the show was with um, Elizabeth, who who does call in regularly, and she's really trying to work out in her own head what it's like to to live in no time to have that experience because uh, she's she just you know she needs she feels she needs to experience it now what what's happened here is that you've got a group of people one from london others from elsewhere who've who've locked into the information that you're putting out and really resonated with it and felt strongly enough about wanting to experience no time and unity consciousness that they are willing to you know travel halfway across the planet in in one instance to experience that so, so how is it going? <laughs> this is the question. <laughs> how are you guys actually finding it? Well, we made it in an hour drive, in about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. We had great conversations the whole way, um, and it was just one of those unique moments where we're, we're all in unison in our conversations and our talking, and uh, you know. What's living in no time is really not agreeing to time anymore. There's one thing I say. If, if I say I'm going to be there at a time, that's the guaranteed time I won't be there. Okay? Yeah. When you, when Andrew, you, when you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, no, Go please ahead. continue. I just, I just want to, I'm reminding myself mentally I need to, to add something about what happened last weekend to me personally. But please continue. All right. Uh, when... 
living in no time is its own experience. It has many different aspects to it. And the main aspect is you're living in the moment. And when you're living in the moment, you're not in expectation. When you're not in expectation, you're not in limitation. And when you're not in limitation, you don't have fear. By eliminating fear, limitation, and expectation inside no time, the actual rules of, of the system of domination control literally can't interact with you because fear is the main tool of domination control, keeps you in the thought structure of the system. Limitation is something we create because our belief systems about reality is uh, not functionally complete or we're taught belief systems that are absolutely false totally. And when it comes to expectation, expectation is what our brain, our heart, our mind gives limitations to and limits us in our ability to have potential sentience available in no time. When you eliminate all three of those things and live in the moment in no time, you can completely and be totally in the flow, and the concept of time no longer applies to you. You know, there have been situations where, you know, we're two hours away, and we get there in an hour and ten minutes, and it should have taken us two hours to get there, and this has happened numerous, numerous, numerous times. Or you get these chain of synchronicities that get going and going and going, um, meeting people. Uh, the, the other day, um, we, I was at the castle, and we went out to go have lunch, a uh, break for a lunch, and uh, the two people that, uh, that were there for the castle, just, uh, they actually ended up at the same restaurant as us and parked literally right in front of us at the same time. So it was, you know, unique karma at that moment, and that synchronicity was, you know, you have lunch together. You don't get in your own way. And that's the most important thing about synchronicities in no time. You can stop yourself from gaining more and more and more synchronicities. Living in no time is allowing the synchronicities to flow and then keeping yourself processed so that you're not limited or in fear or in a state of expectation. It's the best way I can describe it. I mean, yeah, there's a lot more things that go on when you're in no time. It's very easy to make yourself a multidimensional entity and function in seven different dream worlds at once or other different worlds at once. Um, it's a matter of personal choice and spiritual techniques that you follow to have those experiences. Wow. Okay. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, expectations, limitations, and fear. That that really um, actually is very incisive. And I'll have to process that, but... I just wanted to, to share with you what happened on the weekend for me because as, as most of you guys will know and Andrew, and Andrew knows, I spent the weekend with uh, at a One People's meeting in Lake Conjola, New South Wales, 25 of us there for three days, three and a half days. At the beginning of the session, we had a rough agenda, okay? But we agreed at the start that we weren't going to stick to it. We knew what we knew what things we were that we wanted, things, there was a list of experiences we wanted to share and there was a rough sequence put out there but it unfolded completely organically in, in we actually covered pretty much everything that was on the list but not in the same order and not at the times, it just kind of happened and I was actually doing, doing radio uh, I did a five or six radio shows over the weekend. It was actually a really busy weekend for for doing oh. sessions. You now there was two sessions with uh, Andrew and his group, and I had shows with other people and, and the little radio show in Carolina. So I was I was dropping in and out of their event flow. I was actually in in my own event flow, dropping in and out of the group's event flow all weekend. Just to give you an idea of the synchronicities, one of the things that was on the list. Of events was that I was supposed to to do a Tai Chi session. Okay, I was supposed to just lead a Tai Chi session to give some people just the experience of a, of of Tai Chi. And uh, we hadn't I hadn't planned a time. I didn't know when I was going to do it. I finished doing one particular conversation, walked out the door. Everybody else had been doing a chakra dance session, and. Uh, they were kind of breaking from that. I walked up to the group and said, okay, who's up for Tai Chi? Four people put their hands up. We headed off to do some Tai Chi. The other group, the, the rest of the group formed and started working on 
um, Tibetan healing bowls and some chakra chimes, a session on that. And we finished the Tai Chi session and walked back over and, and were immediately you know, hooked into the chime session, which was fantastic. So we all experienced that and then we simply walked over and lunch was ready. So it was, it was, it, that was the kind of flow. I was in and out of that all weekend. It was, I really had, apart, the only thing that was driving my weekend was that the shows, because the shows were specific people, specific times, I was kind of been pulling, pulling in and out of some version of linear time, if you like, forced by those, if you like, specific events that had to happen at certain times. But going, and I was very aware that as soon as I, as soon as I walked away from that, I was in a different place. In a different flow, and it really highlighted for me how that how that works. Um, even as a hybrid situation, it can work if provided you're aware of it, and allow the allow for the fact that you're you're not stepping from one itinerary into another itinerary. You're going from you know, in my instance, I was on a specific itinerary, going back to no itinerary, and it was great. It worked. Mm. You had your own little no time experience over there. Absolutely, and the people who were in it for the whole weekend, they had a real no time experience. Most of them didn't have a clue in what day it was, frankly. Yep. Well, that's what it's been like for the last 11 months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really interesting how it flows, and, and the end result is that everybody has their own version of the experience, and it's completely organic. And it seems to flow with ease. That's the interesting thing about it. There was never a situation where, where, where anyone was having a heated conversation about what they were supposed to do next. It just flowed. And I think, I think it's, it's that allowing, that, that knowing that it's, it's, it doesn't have to be done to a particular time just has to be done to you know everybody's sort of joint intention and when you do that the enjoyment factor goes through the roof we had a fantastic time so I got a question uh, this this past weekend we did that open brainstorming with Blake um, Greg Prescott in at in 5d hey Greg I know you're out there um, Larry myself um, Lance and uh, who else was there? You were there too. Yep, I was. It was really a special show. You want to really get to, to talk about that, or did you talk about it at the beginning of the show? Actually, no, we didn't. We didn't speak about that, and I must must point it. But it did come up during the show slightly, and I I actually um, lost the opportunity to mention it. So thank you for bringing that back onto the plate. And it was a, it was a brainstorming session, really about about things we can actually do. It was essentially a, a meeting of a group of radio show hosts and light workers uh, co in combination, and the discussion was really about you know what what is it that we can do next to actually move everybody forward, and answers were many and varied. The the overall thrust is that we need to continue to network outwards and provide opportunities for larger and larger conversations to take place. So we were talking about webinars and you know other other ways that we could actually run radio shows, etc, etc. And the sorts of subject matters that needed to actually be discussed. And the subject we centered on towards the end of it was my my personal favourite, which we actually started to discuss during the show today, Andrew, we're starting to, to talk about about how we transition, what we actually do, and uh, the issues of of putting the right information out at the right time in the right way to remove the fear factor during the transition to turn it into a joy event, which is how I see it unfolding in my mind when I think about it and um, you know that that will that will absolutely result in in more and more conversations and we did discuss that during the show today it's a subject that I tend to jump to because it's on my mind and I've had so many great conversations with people around me for months and months and months now we're all sort of itching to put them out there so the brainstorming session was a really really um, great thing to listen to there's um, 
other people that weren't in the conversation that uh, will join it at a later point. Uh, Teal, Teal Scott in particular, I had a, an email back from... Um, Blake. From Blake, yes. His name went right out of my head there as soon as I thought about him. I could see his face but couldn't remember his name. I had an email back from Blake saying that... that um, he and Teal wanted to have some discussions with me about the concepts we were kicking around so that she could actually uh, see where they fitted into her view of things. So it's, it's great to get that kind of reaction because it, you know, that kind of positive feedback means that it's, it's a thought that resonates and that means it's, it's swung into view so therefore you follow it and that's how the flow works. Absolutely, that's how the flow works. You don't hinder it. Correct. So how was the brainstorming session for you, Andrew? How did, what did you get from it? It was very special. Um, there were subjects, Matt, that brought up that I've been waiting quite some time to bring up. To have both you, Lance, Larry, and Helene, and Greg, and me all in the same room discussing these brainstorming topics was an opportunity to go very high energy and to reach into the information field that normally I don't get to access. Um, and that particular one was putting um, billboard signs up with uh, Teal Scott's vibrational artwork in the center of the biggest cities of the world. And, that was uh, a great concept. Uh, I, really, I really love the uh, idea of doing that. If anyone out there is familiar with Teal Scott's work, and if you're not, I'll go to, uh, to, to just uh, Google Teal Scott, and you'll find a uh, link to her artwork that she does, and these are all vibrational pattern artworks. And these artworks actually influence the vibrations of the surroundings or the other sentients that are observing it. And the influence isn't mind programming or anything that affects. It's joy, light, and love energy. It's understanding energy. It's helping the energies unravel itself. And when I spoke to Blake privately about this, you know, you know he was a little bit giddy, but because the concept to put it on a billboard... And I went and did the research for it, and we're going to be doing a, a special event coming up here that we're going to raise money to sponsor all the billboards, and we're going to put it on taxis. A uh, billboard in Los Angeles, uh, right in the downtown of Los Angeles on the 101, or right at Hollywood Vine. And then we're going to do taxis and buses in New York City. Yeah, see, so that's a, a, a great thing to... to um focus on from you know the the webinar work that you guys are doing will generate a certain amount of money and if it can be put towards those sorts of things especially what a great investment mm -hmm. absolutely hold on one second I'm, yeah i'm just actually i've just actually um pulled up some of teal's artwork and i was going to post the link in the chat room but it has too many characters but if you just google teal scott art you'll drop into some selections of of the artwork that she's actually done all of which are um very pleasant on the eye when you and i started talking about returning people to the manor role there was a state there that you went into your venusian philosopher super mode and for about I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, you were on such a poetic radio role that it almost put tears to my eye. And both you and Lance were in, in, in very, you know, incredible form at that point because, you know, Lance and you would play off each other and Lance would play off of Blake, so on and so forth, until we got to this point of understanding that our government can be changed, but by the individuals. You know, yes. a single corporation cannot change the world. A single individual can we even got to the point of understanding if you wanted to change the world, it's just nobody show up to work. Through yeah. the population, that's not show up to work. That's it. Put it to the end of their knees. Yep. Mm. There's, there's yeah. a number of things that, that we could do jointly. Not showing up to work is one. Stop paying mortgages. Stop paying mm -hmm. credit cards. If everybody did that, that's, that's, that's pulling the handbrake on while the car's in motion. It's a, a cooperative of uncooperative people. Exactly. It's peaceful non-cooperation, which is the absolute key here. There is absolutely no violence in anything that, that we do from this point forward. We need to do it in service, whatever it is that we do, and fully conscious that we are serving one another in, the, in this task. 
and after the radio show, there was there was this while that I I had gone into one of my meditations, and it's uh, we talk service to self, service to service to others, or service being service to the world. I'm referring this to something different. I'm going to coin a new phrase, and the service it's called service the system, or service to nature, because that's where we're at. We're a polarity where people are being service to the system of domination and control because they have not regained their sovereign free will, and it is their own right to give it away or to reclaim it. And until those people begin reclaiming it, there I'm going to give this the buzzword of service to systems. Yeah, that's a pretty accurate description. In fact, during the earlier during the show, Andrew, I gave my version of a description of the system, which is 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 that if you want to understand the system, you need to view it as as one giant corporation. Yep, absolutely. And nothing and nothing more than that. And and, and, it, and it's what you what you are energy harvesting systems. Yep, absolutely. And so you're you're unknowingly you've you've actually given me a uh, term that I can actually use in these sorts of conversations. So thank you for that, because it is service to the system. Any any time we even any time we pay a bill, any time we interact with a government department, and there was a question actually, Andrew, from someone who emailed this to me, which I'd like to put to you because it relates directly back to this rejection of the of the system as it stands through the sole contract revocations. And the question was that, okay, I've, I've read the sole contract revocations, I understand them, I feel them, they resonate with me. Does this now mean that to, to really drive it home, I need to completely pull out of the system, that's cancel all contracts, cancel the credit cards, you know, walk away from the mortgage? You know, at what point do people have to do that? Ah, very, very good question. And I, I've answered this question a number of different ways. And the reason I answer it different ways is each day we go by, more and more people are pulling themselves out of the system, but they're not pulling out of their system, the system and reinvesting it somewhere else. In the sole contract revocations that the ones that are people reading and the ones they're making for their own, you're removing yourself from the system's form of domination and control. You're removing them yourself from the energy harvesting system. When you go through and carefully look at the wording, you create a spiritual court of equity that has all of your ancestors, past, present, and future in it, and that has the Earth Mother, and they're here. They're there to hear your decision of free will, your expression of free will, your sovereign I am mighty self. And when your mighty I am self expresses itself to the court in, in a state where the Earth is present, any soul contract that has foul intent, hidden intent, fine print in it, becomes null and void. So you're removing yourself from the energy harvesting system that was created by the 15 multidimensional beings. When you look at the system itself, it is based off of a term called usury. Are you familiar with usury? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the. In fact, you spoke of it at the in the session with Julian and the Pleiadians, um, yep. just on the weekend, and I and I. Uh, Another amazing session, actually, because it was very interesting to see how that term played into the situation that was unfolding. Yeah. Um, usury is a scenario where a group of people create a propaganda system that other people, like um, you know, a cult of personality on a mass scale, they'll mm -hmm. create a propaganda system that other people put their belief into, and then two, three, or four generations afterwards, that belief has no idea where it came from, and everyone is in that belief system. And that is what our system is, usury. They created a system and told us it was real, and anyone that was saying during that time that it wasn't real was killed. Well, so a few million people died a few thousand, hundred thousand years ago, but since that time, anyone that challenges it has to challenge a belief system and not the actual usury spirits. The soul contract removals that you were referring to go directly to the usury spirits. Okay, so pulling out... You, are you saying that you don't have to pull out of all physical contracts? You can. Um, that is a, a, a different step for individuals that are in debt enslavement um, or have been taken over by that or, or stuck in the courts. Um, that is a good way to go, but it's an individual's choice on an individual basis because 
one person's pleasure is another person's pain. You know, let's say you're starving and don't have a credit card to go and get yourself some food. What are you going to do? Exactly. If you have, exactly. Two, a price. If you have two kids and they need shoes to go back to school and one of the other kids' shoes has a hole in it, you're going to go and get shoes, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there yep. has to be a practical understanding. When you're removing yourself from the system, you're starting at the energy harvesting systems. When you're creating an, a spiritual court of equity, it's to declare that your ancestors are free too. When you do this, when you declare yourself free of that system, you get a tremendous amount of energy returned to you. And what I've been noticing is, is so many people that read this, the contract and revocations have a, this, a massive awakening. They go and listen to other shows. They begin cleaning themselves with saltwater baths or learning liver cleanses or so on and so forth, and they get onto the practice of being themselves. That's the most important thing to get out of those contracts. This is a consciousness awakening phase. There's no monetary act that will actually change the system. There's no actual physical thing one can do to the system itself through paperwork that can change it unless there's a mass scale. Um, you were talking about the One People's Trust documents, the energetic documents that so many people have, you know, great respect for. You know, a thousand people can make energetic documents, but when you have a million people behind a single document properly worded that goes into a system where everyone that has been put their energy into that document has done contract revocations to the system, you are literally putting a poison pill into that system. Yeah, it's Dan, Andrew, it's always been about the numbers, ultimately. And in the end, I, I believe there will be a physical exit from the system on a mass scale. That will um, be the final, the final plan. Think of it like a, like a furniture's blowout sale. <laughs> a furniture yeah. company blowout sale, you know, they have those advertisements, 99% off on everything in the store. Come tomorrow or you lose it all. Exactly. It's going to be like that. You know, am, yeah. I, am I setting my words in stone? Well, the universe has some very strange things up its sleeve. All right? Um, yep. I've talked about in some of the other shows what will, what will take over the system, and that's the sentience of Earth. It will begin to function through all physical transactions of exchange for value. So there will be no corruption and no scamming, no more Nigerian princes, no more emails that tell you about four-hour erections for $1,000. That all comes to an end because any nefarious scamming energy that is trying to steal your energy without a proper exchange is going to be overseen by the earth and those energy beings that continue to do that will be removed from the system of money and they won't be able to function with it and they'll be asked to leave the world. Interesting. Interesting. And You actually said a couple of pivotal things. Um, the practice of being yourselves and, and service to nature. To me, these are these are one and the same thing, and I and I I saw that on the weekend. The 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 people were actually being human and being themselves, and I, and I may have said this during my my um, putting forth of my ideas in that in that um, webinar the other day. That one of the things that hasn't been seen on this earth for a very very long time is human beings being human beings. Because we've been turned into something else by the system. And that's what I look forward to most of all because it was an absolute pleasure to see everybody being authentic humans on the weekend. Exactly, authentic humans. You know, you know they started this 40-hour work week thing. They started, you know, the unions, the, the, everything that's in between it. And it, it was about taking the family structure away. And as they took the family structure away, the individual structure was radically changed. Um, we've, uh, before, when we were talking about what the heck happened in the 20th century and how the collegiate systems were hijacked, well, it was all to take the individual's power away. And now it's, uh, it's being returned, and it's, being re it's actually being reclaimed by us. By individuals. The world has been changed by pitchforks and torches for the last 100,000 years. Yep, well, uh, we may not need to actually use the pitchfork, pitchforks and the torches. No, but, but you can make signs that have a pitchfork and one has a torch. 
Exactly. Exactly. It's big you can sign. Use the, you, a big you can use people the, carrying signs with pitchforks and torches on them. It makes the, it makes your point known. Yes, and it's actually using the same technique they love to use: symbology. Right. Symbols have power. Right. Symbols have power. You know, one of the other things that came up on the webinar this this weekend with Julian was um, the usury spirit as well as the communications of the different cultures in unity consciousness. Example, you have a Pleiadian, Arcturian, so on and so forth, you know, 5,383 different unity conscious worlds. Well, none of those 5,383 worlds are in a singular unity consciousness. They're all separate unity consciousness worlds. And that's the next area that the galactic historian is going to be focusing on. There was a previous time in our history where these worlds were in a semi-unified state of being where many of their, their higher, higher end multidimensional beings became part of a network system where all these planets were, were linked into one massive unity consciousness system. So you're saying that, the, as I recall from the webinar, that Earth has the capability, the planet has the capability to actually form the hub yep, for, the network hub. A, a, for a unified consciousness between unity collectives. Correct. That is absolutely that's what uh, amazing. That's what, I've been working on. that's what I've been working on in the higher planes the last four days. Um, there was a, an incident uh, about 10 days ago that I haven't spoke about privately or publicly other than to very, very few people. And there was a, a series of consciousness first strike events that happened. And I say the term first strike because it has a military tendency in it. And you've heard me describe how one person in time travel does one thing, somebody comes and erases it, and somebody comes and erases that, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, there were, Ten days ago, there was a massive event worldwide where over, there was over 250,000 separate timeline incursions spread all over the world. And uh, everything got altered back to roughly the way it was. And what they were trying to do was eliminate... Um, whistleblowers that were coming up in the future timelines that they were seeing three, five, or seven days ahead of time. Right. Um, and then massive counter to it. And then there was these interdimensional unity conscious weapons that were used to try to spark unity consciousness on a global scale. And then those devices were countered. And what would actually happen was a massive paradox stalemate. And that's why so many people in the last 10 days have felt so awkward. Another paradox has been added to them. And this is actually forcefully awakening even the most sleeping people right now. Wow. Everything you do to, make, to change it makes it worse. And Earth has begin, begun her expression to all the galactics that are out there, both good and bad. Get out of our solar system or she's going to make you get out forcefully. Really? They're not going to enforce quarantine anymore at all. Wow. Right. Is that They're applying to... So is that applying to the ETs are here who are here to help us as well? Everything. This must unfold naturally. Only those with the soul-family relations to be a part of this scenario of the final resolution of karma are going to be here. All others that are waiting for their karma to be resolved after we resolve our karma, that are those races that are three to five years away from extinction, you're now being told by Earth consciousness, get out and don't come back. The next mm. timeline incursion done by any of those, Earth will instantly ask for Prime Creator to begin erasures of all those societies. Wow. Even told her of your societies. You cannot Whoa. interfere anymore. This one must unfold naturally. The event that you guys started um, 10 days ago has now resulted in the last set of actions that are going to be done. Um, there is no more, no more chances for those beings that you're going to use time travel technology or timeline genocide or timeline incursions to alter us. So the planet has literally called, uh, called an end to the timeline wars. Correct. And it said the next species that uses it will be the prime creator will come in and erase their species. Is there a time deadline for them to withdraw? Um, 
a lot have already withdrawn. The ones that aren't withdrawing are shutting down weapons, defensive weapon systems that were put in to keep a large volume of the reptoids out. Um, mm -hmm. For those out there that, that don't understand, the reptoids were, were heavily defeated in our solar system. There's about 35,000 of their planet ships that are massive wreckages outside of our solar system. So it's mm -hmm. not like they, they, they can really make it here and reinvest in this world. And they have a massive beachhead invasion by a series of other species that are in related to the Silver Legion. So not only do they have a backdoor war, they have a war inside their own society right now because many of the species of the reptiles have been demonized for stuff that they never did wrong. So there's a massive war on species going on, as well as there being a massive beachhead invasion into their part of the galaxy. What minor amounts of vessels are left here have been hiding for a long time, and those are the more hardcore zealot ones that are looking to recreate their own system somewhere else. If they actually try to reach out here and do something with the amount of high energy beings that are here on Earth, I have no doubt that they would be dealt with and, and recycled to, to complete erasure. Andrew, we have about three minutes left. And I'd love to continue this uh, information flow in the next show, so we can we can uh, you know find out whatever details are actually available to us at the moment. Do you want to spend the next few minutes wrapping up uh, the um, the Unity Consciousness experiment that you're doing? Anything you wanted to say about that to bring forth? Uh, I'm going to leave it a little bit of a surprise to, to them over here, so it, it just kind of sparks in them when they see it in front of them on an unfold. Very good, very good. Well, look, you've, you've, again, you've just dropped you've just dropped some more new information on us about um, this this new aspect that's been imposed by Earth herself, which is very very interesting information. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a show on Thursday with Nikki Fetzi. Um, any other things that you need to talk about for this week or going into next week? Uh, have people keep tuned to In Five D Radio as well as SovereignMedia.net. Um, we're going to reschedule the, the last Teal Scott one because Teal was sick, wasn't able to come on last Saturday. I believe it's scheduled, rescheduled for the 28th. Um, I will be broadcasting from Hawaii from that. Um, people look forward that have been asking me about the reading rooms. I'll be posting the next set of dates for the reading rooms so I can make up, uh, work up on my backlog of readings. Um, I'll be contacting you through this, uh, the admin account on um, my email. Um, pretty much that's it right now. I have a lot of work going on in the background. I'm going to be doing the skeletal framework for the, the book Walking in Energy while I'm in Hawaii. So for all those that have been asking about the book, um, they should be available by the end of the year. And then the videos that I did with Lance White should also be available by probably second or third week in September. We've had a we've had a significant amount of editing that we had to do just to give it the right the right the right look. You know, it was better to wait an extra month to get it right and putting it out and and it looking like you know a YouTube video. Excellent. Okay, well, look, thank you, thank you, Andrew, for coming back and, and uh, doing the extra hour. I'm glad we were able to, to do that. It's uh, one of the good things about being on this channel. We'll be able to run over time. We've uh, got about a minute left, so please pass on my thanks to Sandy and Pavan, and uh, let Pavan know that we'll, we'll be in touch with, with her um, regarding her forays back into the City of London. That sounds very interesting. But also thanks to Elizabeth and Janice who spent time with me on the show and, and uh, brought out some really, really interesting things in our discussions. So to everybody, to Andrew and, and the crew that he's with, thanks for joining us. Hope the rest of the your session is great. To everyone in the chat room and listening, thank you for hanging in there for the whole three hours. It's awesome. And we'll see everybody in two days' time. All right. Take it easy. This is Lookout Mountain signing off. Okay. And this is Chris Hale signing off. We'll see you in, in two days' time. <laughs> we'll see you in two days' time on the next Galactic History Show. Roger, over and